All right, now Marty had you had something you wanted to share that I'm aware of that is a somber note. I think you I think you were aware of the death yes. of um, Walter Mankoff. Yes. Oh no. Yes. My yeah. former my former predecessor and Christine's former predecessor. Oh. Who else on this call was chair one time or another? Eric. Um, <laughs> he, <Boy. died. laughs> he died last week in the hospital, and I sent Lowell and uh, Jesse a copy of the. Penn South announcement that went to shareholders. Uh, if you decide that the board needs to acknowledge it in some way, there's a text there that will be helpful to you. Thank you, Mario. Awesome. I appreciate that. I, I reached out to uh, uh, um, Mario and uh, Brandon earlier, but I'm sure they were. Mm. Busy. I didn't see you. Marty, had he been ill for a while or? No. This uh, was sudden. I mean, I, I, he may have been in denial. I, what, what can I say? He participated in the most recent Penn South board meeting. But he was, he, you could tell he was really from weak. From the hospital, I have to add, Betty. I'm sorry I interrupted. Oh, from the hospital? He participated from his deathbed. That's dead. Wow. really dedication. Well, he was also a great 91, which is pretty amazing. You would never think that of Walter, you know? 91? Yep. Oh, that age. H, 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 yeah. <laughs> not the class of. Yeah, right. That was not the year <laughs> of. This is a new football team. <laughs> 1891, maybe, but. Well, it's very um, sad. Oh, yeah. it, was the, it was until the end at the Transportation Committee, and he was the chair of the Transportation Committee before. And he was always incredibly sharp. He had always comments which were really taking a different angle and, and I'm really sad. How long was he on the board? Jesse or Joe? Oh, oh very long. I would have to look back. I, I, I don't know. I mean, it was a chair twice. Well, we, yeah. can do, we can do it this way. Joe, how long were you on the board when he finally joined? Making, uh, maybe 15 years or 16 right. years. That, so would have meant, that would have meant he joined in the 90s. In the 90s. Oh, I was going to say the 1940s, but you know. <laughs> yeah, there you go, there you go, Lowell. I I'm giving you an excuse because of your colonoscopy. Right, exactly. Um, no, but but he was he he along with Simone Sinden led us through the whole West Chelsea Hudson Yards Carmen Center rezoning. It was pretty amazing, you know. And the stadium. Yeah, the whole stadium stuff. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Walter, you remember that me, me and Christine where we had to walk through the gantlet of the Union people on 42nd Street. Yeah. Like 300 workers, like didn't want to let the community board members into the, the hearing we were having, and Walter just truly walked right in. Yeah, it was it was good. He was one of the good ones. All right. Well, the board will acknowledge it, and you know, and and will announce it at our next full board meeting as well. Even though he didn't want something done, I think at some point when they have a memorial, we should participate, Lowell, because he was a very keen. Yeah. Member. Yep. Um, sure. Yep. No, no question, no question. All right, um, I think everyone's just about here, so let's get started. Um, for the record, this is the executive committee meeting for the month of April for Manhattan Community Board 4. We are conducting this via Zoom under a 13-month standing order from the governor, um, and we have our agenda. Um, the first item on the agenda is policy recommendations on the state and city proposals for hotel and commercial buildings zoning waivers. I'm not sure who's taking this one. Who wants to lead us through this discussion? Mr. Restuccia. So um, first, uh, Jesse has sent out a document. Last Friday, we sent out an updated document, and I think wires got crossed. So you have one that's maybe one generation old. But this discussion started, was proposed on the 13th of April. It went to the Clinton Health Kitchen Land Use Committee on the 14th. We made further changes. We referred to the Chelsea Land Use Committee on the 19th. They did further changes. And then the executive committee is taking it up tonight. So Jesse and I figured almost like 30 people of the board have already seen this document. And tonight, our goal is to review, adopt <clears throat> the policy recommendations, and then bring it to the full board for the May 7th meeting. Uh, the reason we are on this trajectory is because $100 million has been, there, there are two initiatives, as you can tell, as you know, there is a state city initiative to acquire hotels and their office, underused office buildings for affordable, supportive housing or shelter. 
and then there is a state endeavor to do the same thing. In the state budget, the state put aside $100 million for this effort citywide, uh, statewide, but they specifically, because of issues about how it could be used, have not done any sort of enabling legislation or regulations to govern it. Uh, our state elected officials informed us that it would be very helpful if our board took a position and laid out policy guidelines to help guide the discussion. What we adopt uh, tonight and then eventually the whole board does not necessarily mean that's gonna be the end all of what gets settled because this is part of the state work, but at least it puts us out clearly as a marker as to what we believe makes sense. So for those members who have been following this, the document that was sent out and the last date on it is 426 being today, there's an intro that talks about what has happened so far. And then there's a section about general principles. I will note that almost all of those general principles were part of the letter we adopted at our April board meeting. The only additional items in there came from the Chelsea Land Use Committee. And there's one bullet that adds on that service providers, that if you open, if people have the document or can go to it, if you, it's on line 51 of the document, Service providers must comply with New York state law restricting registered state sex offenders domiciled in certain proximities of educational facilities. This issue was raised at the Chelsea Lanius Committee that uh, shelter residents or support housing residents or sex offenders cannot live in pro proximity to certain schools. And then the next item that is new is use of the ground floor space, commercial spaces should reflect the uses of the surrounding blocks to reinforce neighbor character. Out of the Chelsea Land Use Committee, uh, uh, and then subsequently discussed by Paul and Betty and myself, the re recommendation was to do medical facilities on the ground floor of affordable housing, supportive housing, or residential buildings. And I we had a very good discussion and made it clear that normally the idea of supportive housing or affordable housing is integration of people into the neighborhood, not creating sort of enclaves where services happen only. And so we changed this to talk about that if a, if a hotel is converted in the flower district, it should be respecting the flower district, the garment center, respecting the garment center. So it creates more retail continuity for the existing neighborhood. And the items that have been talked with great degree are the three next sections, homeless shelter conversions, supportive housing conversions, or affordable housing conversions. And let me ask um, each of our, because oh, JD is not here tonight, he's uh, uh, traveling, he cannot be at this meeting. Um, if Betty, Paul, and I can take one section each and just talk about the, the, re the response that our committees, uh, you know, gave to it. So, um, I'll do um, the first one. If you want. Yeah, go ahead, Betty. Yeah, yeah. So, homeless shelter conversions. Um, we we had a lot of back and forth about the first bullet. New shelters should not be located in proximity to existing shelters, social service facilities or other new supportive housing units within a 500 foot radius for a cumulative total of 150, 150 beds or social service users within that radius. Now, I don't know if the Dropbox, if you got the maps with-, with, with We're gonna put that up in a second, Betty. Uh, okay. Jess is gonna put it up in a second, yeah. That, that would be very useful because we needed to kind of have some examples of that because it was a little confusing. And then uh, only one shelter should be sited on block fronts between two intersecting se streets. New shelters should range from 50 to 100 beds with those below 75 preferred. New shelters should include units for family households, not only single individuals, and give preference to veterans. That A lot of that came from Chelsea Land Use. All shelters must include required on-site social service support and staff, office space, security, and resident common space. I think that's pretty much what we had before. Um, I think it would be helpful if those radius maps yep. open up. So just to give you a background, the big discussion in both committees was about the radius issue. So we decided to put together a map showing how the radiuses intersect. Jesse, if you can bring it up. Yeah, give me a couple minutes. It's still loading. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Meanwhile, may I ask, uh, ask a question? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, on line 63, only one shelter should be sited on block front between two intersecting streets. 
Um, I find that a little bit confusing. Are, are we talking streets or avenues? And then well, I, I a block front is two sides of the block, each side of the block. Right, so I, I, I really welcome any changes. We put this together very quickly, this one. What we're trying to, let me tell you what we're trying to talk about is that on a block, there should only be one shelter. Yeah, and we have right. to, and so we have to I, say it in like city planning languages. So I'm, I'm still struggling with so. Right. 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 So I think we need to clarify this one a little bit. Okay. It should, it should maybe be. maybe we should put um, should between be between two on any street between, between two avenues. avenues. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I was trying to make it a little more general because this might be used on a broader. Well, you can you can say between two intersections. Don't say street intersection. Right. I, I think I'd go more specific. I'd say on any. I'm going to say avenues, and then if the state wants to use this for broader purposes, they can figure out how to. Well, well, right, Joe, right. Joe, right. what I would say is on any street between two avenues, or on any avenue between two streets. Right. Okay, that's good too. Yeah. yeah. And then there easy. should be only one. Uh, so remove the block front and say there should be only one. Yes. Shelter. But right. the distance, the distance between two streets on an avenue. Is much less yeah, I know. distance between two avenues on a street. Well, that's not the same. That's where the 500 foot rule comes in. Bert. That's yeah. what, yeah. I'm loaded so, up here. So if you want me to share my yeah. screen, though, okay. Yeah, let, let, let's do that so you can see. So to help this discussion further, this was discussed very heavily in the uh, Chelsea Land Use Committee, especially. Can you make this a little bit? Can you zoom in, Jesse? The... I know you can. Mm. I think you need to end the show and then yeah, end the show and zoom in. Then you can start the show. And the show is at the bottom there. Wait, yeah. While while he's doing that, remember that the original grid of the city of New York was 800 feet by 200 feet, uh, and the 500 foot rule doesn't quite mesh with those dimensions. Right. And I don't know. You'll how be able to see. You'll be able to see how how it works. We, the radius is really kind of tell the story here. Yeah. When, when we, while we're waiting for the map, but Joe, why don't you go into the next section then? And, and because sure. the, ra the radius discussion hits the next section too. Right. So the next section is about supportive housing. Again, we use the same radius thing about and say 150 beds max for social service users. And I wanted to just amplify on that for a second. There are certain circumstances where we have uh, domiciled locations for social service, but also just heavy use. So a methadone clinic, for example or Fountain House that has over 900 people coming to that clubhouse every day. The idea is not to concentrate social service use, whether it's domiciled or just day use at the same location. Uh, so I'm, right, I'm gonna share my screen now, okay? Okay. Can do this. Great, now if you can zoom in, yeah, there we go, perfect. Now drag it down a little bit, Jesse, so we can see the middle, yeah. Perfect, so um, let's, you know, uh, sorry, uh, bring it, I want to see the northern part of the district. I want to see the southern part of the district. <laughs> I know. I knew that. So I think, whoop, there you go. So I think this map starts to tell the story a great deal. These radii, right, are the center. This is a social service use. And you can see how there's all this overlapping. So it's clear that, for example, on the blocks between 47th Street, 48th Street, we are, we have social service use and there could be no be used there. But if you went to the block to the north where it says two, that space, if you look in the key, which is the 52nd Street Women's Shelter, which has 120 beds, there'd only be the possibility to add another 30 users or beds in that radius. So it gives you an idea that certain parts of the district are quite heavily used and quite full of social, social service uses. You want to come down, why don't, you, why don't you go down to the south where Chelsea is? So you can yeah. see the contrast between uh, Hell's Kitchen there, and Chelsea. There you go. So all of a sudden, you go down to Chelsea, and it's a very different scenario here. So, and now some of those uses are uh, larger. So let's say uh, 15 and, sorry, 20. BRC is, is, is 18 and, and 16. It's big. Right. So, so some of those are quite large, right? Others, others are smaller. Uh, 17 St. Francis, 79 beds. 
So there's a possibility that in fact, there could be more use for social service type uses. However, remember, this is also a function of the real estate market and where are the hotels? So Jesse, if you go to the next slide, This, and I gotta see the legend, Jesse, still existing, existing conditions. Well, well yeah, that, then you get there to health kitchen, it's very right. busy. So now, but we've added in, added in on this slide. If you see the blue, if, Jesse, if you can make it bigger so we can see the, out, uh, the buildings outlined in blue, right? Those are hotels. So you begin to see that existing social service use, even if there are hotels in certain locations, that would be very difficult to bring in more social service use. Depending sorry, upon the blue is a commercial, is commercial class B and C office. It's the orange that's hotels. I'm sorry, the orange, I apologize. There you go. So we, we can see how it works together that in the area where there's predominant social service use, this criteria would not allow further social service use, but in the area, so let's go to that to Chelsea, Jesse. Right. So here you see there are some hotels in Chelsea, but some of them, of course, are way too large for this kind of change, like the Maritime Hotel on 17th Street, high-end property, the value would be way too high. It's, it's we're looking at really, it's the budget hotels, which are number, here, the number 16, or on that block above it. Again, these are mid-block. Oh, that's actually the Chelsea Hotel. It's not gonna happen. But if you, no, but if you look at number 28 is the um, Savoy Hotel. I'm sorry, the Gem Hotel. The Gem Hotel yeah, on that's, the 22nd that's... and 8th Avenue is currently closed. closed. It's outside of any of these radii. Um, so that means that that would be one hotel that potentially could be converted if GEM ownership considers itself distressed and makes itself available for city acquisition. Right, city or state. Right. So just let's take some questions about these slides from the members and then we'll go back to the document. Or do so you we'll wanna go, that. Joe, do you wanna go to the examples? Hmm. In, in a minute, I, I, just wanna, I just wanna get some, get some conversation going about this in general. Joe, does this include, yeah, I, I'm looking at, I think what is number 31, because I can't read the legend. Is that your SRO on the corner of 23rd and 11th? Yes. Okay. Yes. So would that qualify if you wanted to claim you that, you know, it was available? Just so let's go, let's go to 19 in the yellow, Jesse. I can't see which one that is. That's, oh, that's, that's, well, that's, that's Columbus House. Eight. Yeah, that, yeah, that's gonna be the, the, the age shelf. Yeah, so Flemister House has 47 beds, right? So in that um, radii, in, in that radius, another 100 beds could be built theoretically. So if you wanted to, you could turn over that SRO. Correct, and that, but that SRO is currently um, scheduled yeah, to become 23 units of affordable housing. Yeah, you got different issues there, I understand. I just happen right. to... I, it, it's not numbers to me since that's the block I live on. I know what was there. So <laughs> right. was for an example that I understood. Can you go up uh, uh, on, uh, see the legend there? Right. So. Is and we'll it, put this in the drop I don't know, box. For, for the consumption of everybody, is there a way of, of taking things which are already, you know, on this chart to put one color with the one which are already a, um, you know, e either a homeless or facility, right? And yes, then yes, they, they are. So all the yellow is an existing supportive housing. And all no, of what the I'm red. saying, Joe, something different. Oh. Is, is there a way to simplify the chart by just showing two things? One is... These are the ones that are already, and they are the one that could become. Yes. Could be eligible. The first That's it. But if, if we don't... They do that. So let's, let's go back to those for a second. Where am I Jesse, going? Go, go, go to number two. Slide. I'm here. It's, it, it's, uh, it's loading, Christine. Oh, I got it. Oh, I'm here. I don't know why you can't see it. I do. We're seeing, yep. No, I think we're seeing the old one. No. Right, Jesse? The old one. No, this is this is slide number two. 
It didn't change. Yeah, there is less stuff. Yeah, no, slide number yeah. two has less stuff on it. Right. <laughs> right, I know, but it's, but it's not showing that way, right, Christine? Well, what I'm saying is that it would be good to have like a very simplified chart. I mean, this is incredible, incredible job. But then having, you know, these are the facilities that count for the 150 feet or the 500 feet or whatever. And then these are the hotels with the potential, you know, and then you so, see just those two things. So, so you can't see it, but Jesse will send it out. That does exist in this presentation, Christine. Okay, good. Yeah, so it's, it's, like it's, just, it, it's just not loading properly for some reason. So to clarify, I'm, I'm here, Joe. I, I, maybe it's not the slide that you want, but no. But just to clarify, all of these uh, the radii radii circles on of the on this are determined by existing supporting service supportive service or shelter sites. Correct. All of these black circles are drawn around an existing facility. Right. And then I would add on the top of that, just the potential hotels, that's all. Right, so, so then if you go, the slide we were on before, go down, Jesse, further, I think. It's hard for me to see it, that's a problem. Which, which slide are we talking about? Go to the one with hotels, I think it's slide four. I think it's four or five, yeah. No, further down. Yeah, no, so now go, so that's actually the one that helps clarify for Christine's question. You can see there's less in each of those concentric circles. Now right. go to now go to the next one. Now you see the hotels, Christine. The hotels, Christine, the orange are um, hotels that are 150 rooms or less and the orange outline is hotels that are over 150 rooms. So unless the city or state changes policy to target hotels over 150, we want those orange outline ones on there so we have a sense of where those are, but it's only the solid color ones that are the existing hotels under 150. Oh no, you've changed the key, I'm sorry. It's the orange outline, the purple outline. I don't know, right. there used to be a solid orange block, used to be on the former versions of this map. So every, every, everything, everything that is not a use is an outline. Everything that is a current use is solid. Mm. Mm. So, so it gives you some clarity that because mm -hmm. there was a confusion visually that it was, you know, yeah, it yeah, was yeah. solid, it was showing that it was there. This is just so much. There's well, a ton Jesse, there. go down to the examples. I know it's, 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 a, it's really a lot. And, and can I just, while, while we're talking, while it's switching again, I just want to, there are a couple people here, uh, part of the Chelsea land use discussion on whether we use, where we came up with 500 feet, 800 feet as a city block, 200 feet as all these numbers. And it's because of these 500 feet radii that overlap that we didn't use the 800 foot number because if you look at this map, it's in, in its entirety, the 500 radii overlapping and then changing the language to include block front per block, um, we exclude a, a great portion of the district from accessibility to conversions. Mm -hmm. So uh, Be Betty suggested to do some examples. So we have two for Hell's, Chelsea and two for Hell's Kitchen. The first one shows you West, basically centers on West 36th Street. And we have their Positive Health Project, West Midtown Med Medical Group, that's a methadone clinic, a barber house, 100 beds, and then a, a small facility with Fountain House with 30 beds. Cumulatively, there's 130 beds there, but also two social service facilities. So under these guidelines, this area, this location could accommodate no further social service use. Go to the next section, Jesse. Well, next wait a minute. It's before you go on, Joe, when you say this section, are you talking this entire grid or just one of those circles? These circles all intersect, which means that one radii is, is affecting the other. So we've met our maximum in all so of for the entire the entire square grid there. Uh, for all the for, all, for the yeah. Or the four consecutive, yeah, the four intersecting circles, right? Okay. Go to go to the next slide. So so wait a minute. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. sorry. One more. So for example, number building number nine, which is just on the edge of one of the circles, because yes. that circle intersects with all the other ones. Nine would be out no matter what, even though it's only on the edge of one of the circles. Correct. Okay. Correct. But conversely, next slide. Here you have. Hell's Kitchen at 454 West 35th Street, 53 beds. Sylvia's Place, 14 beds. They intersect, but 
that's a cumulative a total of 67 beds. So in this area with these two circles, we could accommodate either 83 additional beds or social service users. So it gives you an idea. It's all about the scale because the, the variable we learned in studying this back and forth is you have a one facility that has a lot of beds or a lot of users versus smaller ones. Okay, now without changing the screen again, now how would the single block front rule apply here? So even on, what is that, 36th Street, because there's, because facility 14 is there, it couldn't go on that block. It could go somewhere in the circles, but it couldn't go on that block. Right, it would go on, it can go on 37th Street, it can go on right. 34th Street, or right. either okay. of those facilities. Or right? on the avenues. Right. Or those facilities could accommodate more also. Right. Or on the avenues, correct. Right. But you so couldn't put a second facility on that block. Correct. On 36. Uh, or 35th. You could put right. more people into number 14. Or number 13. Big enough. Right. But you couldn't use number 15. Correct. And, and there actually are two hotels. Because you don't have, you are not at 150. No. Oh. You could bring it, bring it up to 150, right? Right. Yes, yes. You could, I'm sorry. You, you could go to one, but Lowell's point is bring it up to 150, but then the additional prohibition of not more than one facility on a block front. Right. That should be in so terms if, of growth. So if Sylvia's place could go to 150, Christine, you yes. could increase it. But you yes. can't use number fifteen to get to one fifty on that block. Now right. look at that. Look at that orange building on the corner of thirty fourth and the avenue. What's that right. orange building, Joe? That's a that's a, a Sheridan Hotel on thirty fourth and tenth. So if that Sheridan Hotel were to be distressed and considered by conversion from the city of state, that also would not apply because it has avenue facing block on that same block front as that avenue. Uh, no, that's on a different. That's on a different block. No, no, the 17 is not done yet. So the 17 had not, had not claimed, uh, then the 13 could claim 80 server, 87. Oh, I, I think what he means, Christine, is seven, it, it has no number. The orange has, that has no number. On the orange that has no number is an operating hotel. Correct. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 So, so, so I'm, but, I'm staring at it right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. That, that's a good example. You could not convert number 17, but you could convert number, the no number orange on 34th Street, but no more than 83 additional beds. Why, why isn't the one on 35th eligible? Because it's number 13. You already got number 13. On 35th oh, number 13 is an, is an oh, that's um, MCC. Oh, that's 13. That's the no, thir thing. No. I couldn't 13, th 13 is 454 West West 35th Dale. The, the Clinton Housing Building behind you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's just hard to see on the map, but I get it now. Right. So but 13, I mean, 13 would block 17 because they're on the same side street, but it would but not, not the orange. orange building. Right. And I think this is a good example of how we want to keep these things flexible, but at the same time, not cluster and concentrate. Let's go down to Chelsea. Next slide. So here is an example where we have 115 beds at St. Francis II and 62 beds at Christopher Residence on 24th Street and on 8th Avenue. And those two together would say that we could have no more social service use in these two overlapping radii. Or in three radii. You couldn't do it in 15 either. You have three radii there. Right. Well, 15, 15 is the center. The other two of them. Yeah, 16 is, uh, is, is the BRC, which is even larger, right? But go down again. So Joe, next. hold on on that one. Can we just sure. stand on for one second? Just sure. for clarification for people, the orange outline on 23rd Street, just uh, to the lower left of the number 15, that orange outline, that's um, Hotel Chelsea. So that um, would, be, would be eligible for, there would be, because 15 has 62 beds, it's in, within that radius, that, would have the room for what's 62 from 150, so the 80, 80, 88 beds could go into Hotel Chelsea. Right. Because it's within the, the radius that's generated from 15 at the center of that circle. It's a, a hotel on, in that, within that radius. 
But because there are already 62 beds at St. Christopher, the number 15, that would allow 88 beds to be converted at Hotel Chelsea. Now, Hotel Chelsea is you know, a large hotel. It's, it's going to be more than that. So it, the whole hotel wouldn't be converted to a shelter or supportive service housing on that block. All right, but, but again, 25 is, is the Savoy. And 25 that, that's the Savoy, right. Right. And that but 25 I think would, not, would not qualify because the single block stuff anyway. Right. Well, 20, 25 wouldn't qualify because it's within the two adjoining radii. Exactly. Yes. And therefore, it's already within that two radii, there's 177 beds. So the Savoy Hotel at 25 would not be eligible for conversion under this policy guideline. Right. Even though it's empty now and not operating. Right. But it could be, if it were converted, it could be affordable housing without supportive housing in it and social services. Correct. We didn't get to point three yet of the three right. major points, which is affordable housing. Right. But that's that's a good point though, because we were talking about that today, Paul. Yeah. It could it could be the twenty five Savoy affordable Hotel housing. Could be permanently affordable housing. Right. But that's but, the uh, section um, we haven't gotten to because there are no radii that impact affordable housing. But this right. radii only impacts these first two sections. Which are really social service type use. Just yeah, I think that's a good it, you know, I think in the memo that it may be we need some introductory sentence or something that distinguishes the shelters and the supportive housing versus the affordables, you know, mm -hmm. the affordable housing, just that, that there's different criteria. Joe, Jessica has a question. Yes, Jessica. Th thanks, Lil. I just wanted to confer so much, like there's so much detail here and, and I, I to what extent do you feel like the memo will um, provide enough of a, of a guide that should there be changes, like right, nothing, like this is, this reflects a moment in time and the maps do, and things will change. Nonprofits will go out of business, may move facilities. I mean, those things, they happen slowly, but they do happen. So I'm just curious how, like, if you think the memo will be sufficient for providing a guide to inform this work when the maps become outdated. Right, well, that's, that, that's why the criteria exist as, as a whole, because it should not be map-based. It should be, here's the criteria within this right. I just wanna make sure you feel like it's instructive oh, enough. Yeah, yeah I, I think one of the things is, is that we're providing probably more structure than the state legislature expects, because there's sort of like, just do it. You know, like the idea of just do it creates problems. So one of our goals here is to make sure that whether it's a for-profit developer or not-for-profit developer, they're not just acting opportunistically. That there's a property, let's sure. grab it, here's what it is, and then we have to live with the consequences because it's poorly figured out or, you know, right. or managed. Right, I, I totally agree with that. I almost just wonder though, if like, because things will continue to evolve, including that like maybe the flower district shouldn't, like you don't want to be, to be too prescriptive and say like only flower shops should move into the flower district because, you know, maybe there's, a total glut in the flower market, I don't know, globally, I, I, whatever it is, or lumber has to go in the lumber district and we know nobody's opening lumber shops right now because lumber is too expensive. So just whether or not you need like some additional structure to help continue to interpret this as things continue so to evolve. Th that's why we made this change it, in that particular item, Jessica. It says use the ground floor commercial spaces should reflect the uses of the surrounding blocks to reinforce neighbor character. So at any point in time as the character changes, we're just saying that's a general guideline as opposed to saying, I use that as an example for illustration, but that's not what the guideline is. Right. right, okay, okay. I almost just wonder if you need basically this work group or some existing work group to continue to help inform these changes at the community level, knowing that in four years, the world might look like a different place and these guidelines may not be as clear as we think they are because they come from your brains, but. <laughs> uh, when they're translated well, well, into another environment, they may not, they may not reflect the moment anymore. Well, one of the things we asked for as part of our original general principles was community input for transparency, which means this would come to some sort of community and community board discussion. And that's the point that when a proposal is put forth for to convert yeah. number 25, there's a whole community discussion about it like we're having today. I, I, yeah, I think that point's really important to emphasize. I, I hope mm -hmm. it. I hope everyone feels that that's uh, 
you know, a, a key po point of the request. Yeah. Or the Which recommendation. Like, when things happen in the dark, you get problems. Dale? Sure. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. I know the Hotel Chelsea is not going to get converted, but right. it, just, it does raise an issue. Like, as I understand it, Hotel Chelsea is like a mixed use building currently. There's hotel rooms and then there's residences. Yes. So is there some, is there some discussion or way of, or, or need to, or means of precluding any of, of, of those kind of mixed use, other, other mixed use facilities that may well become eligible? Because it seems like you could op that could open up a can of worms. Well, you know, today, anything that is an SRO can also be rented as a transient space, right? And like the Hotel Chelsea is pretty unique because it does have actual transient rooms and SRO rooms. So that's like an oddball item in there. Yeah. But in other places, it, the real issue is if it was an SRO, Dale, and it's under hotel stabilization and it's used for transient, people can claim rights to become permanent tenants. So there'd be a sort of nervousness of how the property is used. I think we have many examples in our district, like the Long Acre Hotel, or you know, on the Upper West Side, the, the one that was very controversial, that had a combination of long-term tenants and transient rooms. So I don't think it's, it's, I don't think it's precluded at all, but it's sort of a nuance, I don't know if we can really capture in this. Yeah, because it it's, it's a particularly odd uh, uh, right. condition. <laughs> and then just so I under, if I understand this map correctly, so for instance, where it's a, where there's number 23, that's a class B or class C office building that's potentially eligible. 23, the purple outline. 20, no, 23 is a hotel under 150. A hotel under 150. And it's in that, it's in one radius. Mm -hmm. Is that radius saturated or is that, would that be technically eligible under our rules? That radius has 115 beds in St. Francis too. So it could it could have it that that's potentially convertible with to 35 beds right. of support. And, and it and it also sort of gets us to the idea that as we go into our next section, that supportive should be part of a larger affordable housing project if it happens, as opposed to standalone. So everything's better right. integrated. Because that building is much larger than 35 supported exactly. units. Exactly. Exactly. What is that building, by the way? That's 24th between 7th and 8th? Well, I'll, find, I'll find it if you can. I'll, I'll look on. I don't, have it in my, I, don't have, I don't have the Chelsea stuff in my head. That's OK. All right, thanks. I, I, think, I'm, I think I'm catching so going on. Going back, going back to the Chelsea Hotel, though, for example, for a second, because there are permanent residents there, but it, it also operates as a transient, could we put, if, if the owner pleaded distress, could we end up with permanent residents living in a space that is converted to a shelter? The Chelsea has actually has certain floors are transient use, right? Okay. And those are able to be converted at, to shelter, of course, because that, that's what's happened in the rest of the hotels, right? But other, other rooms there are permanent use, and that would be very difficult to convert to a transient right. use. Right, but the, the people who are living in a, on a floor that is permanent use would now be living in a building that is also ho hosting a homeless shelter, which is not something they anticipated. Just like the Long Acre Hotel on 45th Street, the, known as the Aladdin, same, same thing, where there are always long-term people there or Pete Diaz's building, where there's a combination of homeless uh, shelter use and permanent residence, it's 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 a mix that is definitely difficult. Yeah, and I, 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 the Chelsea in particular, given how active those tenants are, I can see that one becoming a, a, a real mess. But remember, the whole function here is the real estate market. I'm highly I, doubtful that the real estate is going to turn into for the Chelsea hotel. hotel as a homeless shelter. Right. Right. It's, right. On it's the other open. hand, on the other hand, I believe 23 is the Hampton Inn, which is like a moderate to budget hotel. Yeah, that has much more possibility for some. Right. Like right. Right. So let's go to the last slide, which is a good example in Chelsea. And this is St. Francis 
on 8th Avenue and there are um, possibly uh, a possibility of additional, because they have 79 beds, another 71 beds in this area. You can see it's not saturated. But again, I read to everybody's attention. The function here is something that may be a distressed property doesn't mean that the surrounding blocks are distressed and they are have a high value. And even the sale of a distressed property may not be within the reach of any city or state funding. Mm. Any more questions on sort of how the radius stuff works? Anyone? Yes, got our hand up again. Go ahead. Sorry, I think I just didn't take my hand down. Apologies. Oh. You have a, so let's, let's Lowell, you have a hand, uh, Joe, you have a hand from Brian Weber from the public. I don't know if you're taking one mm -hmm. I, I want to I want to do the committee first and then go to the. Yeah, and let's, and the, can we finish up the letter before we open up to public? Yep. So let's there's, take there's this also, down for a moment. There's also Q, there's a Q&A from the public also, Jeff. Oh, good. Let me just check. On my, are, there are a variety of levels of supportive housing. Are you lumping all supportive housing together? Um, yeah, but let's wait the for the end. Questions. Let's wait. Yeah, for yeah, the that's that's on the public. So let's let's have a discussion. Let's let's go to the next part of the document. Okay. Um, we did homeless shelter conversions and then supportive housing. Let's go back to that. So let's take that down. So supportive housing, we say must we have the required on-site social service support and open space, security, and resident common space. That the model should be for conversion, the city's near city's model, which is a 60% homeless referral and 40% re community resident uh, preference. So the city of New York for decades has no longer done 100% supportive housing, 100% homeless. They do 60% homeless and 40% community residents. We add on that new supportive housing should include units for family households, not only for single individuals. And this is very important, it's came up in the both committees that preferably supportive housing from here on in should be a component of a larger affordable housing project, not on its own. So Betty and Paul, can you speak to that a little bit? Because that's a, a change we made in the last a week or so. I don't know, Paul, do you want to say something about that? Um, no, I, <clears throat> no, I, I think, we, I mean, it's just, we want to have more family households and we want to have veterans. I mean, just a, shift, a little shift in the priorities and just declaring it pretty clearly. Um, and the fact that this, you know, we have often, and this comes up more in the affordable housing section, is that we often look at these as uh, integrating uh, people into the community. So shelters and supportive housing, supportive housing being part of, of affordable complexes and the way that's integrated. Um, it's a position this board has taken on a number of developments where we want to treat people as residents of the community and we want them to integrate. And so that's why we want to force some integration. And so this is uh, that currently would be a the good word to put. I'm sorry, that would be a good word to put in that sentence here to say the purpose is, you know, integration and integration. To promote to come up to promote integration into the community. Exactly. Um, so this the slaughterhouse project at 495 11th Avenue, which is recently certified by uh, by the City Planning Commission, is exactly that. 350 units of affordable housing, 75 of which are supportive housing in a building that has serving people at 50%, 60%, 80%, 125% of AMI after 165. So a broad range of low, moderate, middle with a supportive housing component. And I think that's the idea that it's, we should not be balkanizing people of social service needs, but integrating them. I wanna to move to the next section if we can, um, affordable housing conversions. You want me to take this one? Yep. Um, so again, because affordable is different than shelter and, and um, supportive housing, uh, the, the radius formulas don't come into effect, but we did want to reinforce a lot of the positions that the board has taken in the past um, and that we have um, economic diversity in our developments, uh, that it has for a, a range of incomes. <clears throat> um, the language I forget which version I have now in my inbox, but the range, uh, the range on AMIs, um, we have often taken the position that we want all AMIs included in our affordable housing buildings with full integration of units, meaning you know they can't just separate them out, um, that they are not buildings that stand on their own, that all AMIs are included, and that we avoid holes between income bands. So we wanna make sure to include the language about that. Um, where there is a density, um, we should, where there's a density of social services. So again, going back to 
the streets with the radii maps, if there's a density of social services and there is a convertible site because it's distressed, that should only be for affordable housing. Um, Betty and I were walking on um, 20th Street, 22nd Street today, 20th Street today, and we noted that there is a, a Class B office building that is vacant um, and it's across the street from a, a, a housing service site. Um, so that particular site, if it's going to be converted, would not be for shelter, would not be for supportive housing, but would only be for permanently affordable housing. And then that would be okay, and it would be okay. It would it would be fine. Right. right. Yeah. Um, the the next line in the letter is 15% of new affordable housing must be reserved for referrals homeless, meaning people coming out of homeless situation into their first apartments. That number 15 is a result of that's what the city has been really pushing for a long time. And so we figure out of all the fights we're going to have with the city, let's not fight with them about that line because it's not as egregious as so many other things that they do. Um, and, and, and to note, the current Gianaris bill at the state legislature calls for 50% homeless housing, which, you know, in an affordable housing situation, you have to have a balance and it doesn't make a lot of sense. And, and, then, and, it, doesn't, and it doesn't call for services attached to those, those homeless oh, referrals either. Sure. Yeah, and that if we do, as we've done um, on the, uh, uh, what is it, the DEP side, where we're looking at new affordable housing service, that we make sure that social service funding for social service support goes along with that requirement. Um, we make sure that where there, where there is an HPD Housing Connect lottery, that there is a 50% community preference for residents of the district, um, and that the owner operator should host to agree to train on those things. That kind of concludes our policy recommendations. Uh, Dale, Dale then Christine. Dale. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, when you talk about a diversity of um, affordability, like the income bands, are we? I know it's. I know it's been stated in in uh, you know on other projects that it's a challenge for the developers to administrate like multi income bands in one building, especially if it's not in. A, are we trying to push for like as many income bands in a single structure? Or are we saying like overall we're going to have like AMI spread out through the district that are, you know, uh, distributed? I think part of this, uh, Dale, is that it's going to each development is different. Yeah, and some developers can have much more ability to manage. So, for the new Gotham, for example, I mean, for Gotham West, we have a huge range of incomes there from 50% up to 165, you know, and that's an experienced developer and they're able to manage it. Would I say that that makes sense for a small building of like, you know, 20 units or 30 units? Right. You know, I think it has to be some level of scale, but that's gonna depend upon the economics that are brought to us in these projects really. Okay, so we're still leaving some wiggle room for the practical matter of right. administrating a building like that. Right. Okay. Christine? So yeah, uh, line, um, 95, I think that would deserve to be moved up to start the block. And then I think that's what someone was saying is like, maybe you want to bring that up all the way to the beginning. Christine, um, can you just say what line 95 oh, is? Oh, the I line 95 have, is I don't have yeah, numbers on I'm my sorry. I'm, I'm saying where you say where there is a, a density of social service. Uh, conversion should only focus on new affordable housing. I would. We'll move that yeah, to the general principles. Yeah, either that, the that, that's where it belongs. Yeah, and at the yeah. beginning of this paragraph, right? Yeah. And then the second question I have is that in supportive housing, you say the the community preference should be forty percent, and here you sh you're saying it should be fifty percent. What's the difference between the two? Well, because so, supportive housing is something that is very much set up to have social services attached no matter what. And it focuses a lot of times on singles, Christine. So there's all kinds of service contracts that come with it. Yeah, but what about the 40% community preference? The 40% community preference can, can the, the, the city's supportive housing programs, which do funding, the, their current regulation is 60% homeless referrals, 40% community rental. In outside of that supportive housing program, there's a requirement that there's a 15% homeless requirement. And currently there is no social service support for it whatsoever. That's been a huge issue for developers because mm -hmm. how do you bring people in without providing adequate 
support for them. And why in the last sentence, then we are saying 50% community and not 40%? No, no. Uh, of the, of the, sorry. That's a, because that's the housing community. lottery for the affordable units. Not yeah, for the affordable housing. units, right. Okay. So the house, let's say you have 100% affordable building. You currently have a 50% community preference. Okay. In support of housing, there's a 40% requirement as opposed to a preference. Okay. Because because that supportive housing is oriented toward homeless referrals first and foremost. That's the difference. Um, any other questions? Maria, that's your hand up. Thanks. It was, thank you, Paul. Actually, it was about your question, but I don't, Paul, uh, and Go I don't on. know if Paul should answer or Joe, but it was about the, um, the AMIs and the holes and filling in the gaps. Yeah, we're going to put a language on that. So, so it's very clear that with no gaps, which is the most important thing. Thanks. Well, I propose some language on that. I, right, so I then, think, I'm sorry. Yeah, the version, the, the version that's in the Dropbox doesn't have the proposed language on filling the holes and the gaps. Mm -hmm. but we, there, there is a draft already that's circulating with that in it. Thank you. Any, any other questions from the board? No, I, I, I just was kind of a comment that I, I think that we have worked very hard on that, the two committees and the housing people. And we've come up with something really admirable. And it, it could stand as a model for other community boards and for the city and the state. And the other quick thing is I just want to thank the team of volunteers that went out in Chelsea yeah. and looked at all the buildings there, the, the office buildings in the hotels and what whether they were distressed and it was me and Paul and Pam and Carrie and Alan who's on this uh, Zoom and Paul and Viren and his students and, and Viren and his students did some data work and kudos to Savannah who Ooh, worked right. in Chelsea in, in the Clinton housing development just she made all these maps she does calculations. She prepared the maps that we took out in the field work and just the whole team of us have really produced a lot of the background. I mean, basically we ran our own Columbia planning studio in the course of like five weeks to come up with basic solid information to present something that makes sense as opposed to just pulling it out of thin air. So I'm really happy that our collaboration has been amazing on this. It's amazing it got done so quickly yeah. for this level of detail. Can I ask you something though? Like, I think you, you're you intimate with the data. Ballpark this for us. Like how many feasibly under these guidelines, how many hotels, how many office properties would re, we could reasonably anticipate be converted in the district or within Hell's Kitchen and Chelsea, you know, broken out like ballpark. So, let me give you a different metric. The state has allocated for this purpose $100 million statewide, right? Uh -huh. So, you know, some of these hotels are up on the market for 10, 15, 18 million. That doesn't mean that it's going to be entirely funded by the state. Like, there's mortgages involved, but we should remember realistically, unless there's a huge infusion of money over and above the $100 million, this $100 million could be, you know, eight or nine projects, you know, citywide, citywide. or statewide. So, but it doesn't mean that with the, with the recovery bill coming in, the various, you know, the infrastructure bill, there could be money coming in. So we have to make sure we position this properly because the last thing we want are the, the, the private development community seeing a source of money and quickly grabbing it for, right. you know, a use that they're not, no one's thinking about it entirely, so. Right, opportunistically, yeah. Right. But if the funding were there, there it would still be a, there would still be like a tactile limit, a, a real limit to how many could actually be converted in the in the district. Well, there's also a willingness because it comes down to certain hotel yeah. operators are going to want to operate their hotels. Certain B and C operators are going to want to convert to market rate housing or take a hotel and convert it to market rate housing. Right. So there's a there's a limited uh, bandwidth on this. I think. Got Jeff, it. If you have a question, you seem very intent. No, sorry, I realized my camera wasn't on and I've been listening intently and wanted to show it. I just would flag that $100 million is not that much money and it doesn't get you 
it not for you, this purpose. It right. maybe gets you a building and a half, right? If we're looking at acquisition, so right. uh, no, our maybe the remember the money is not. It has to be combined with the buildings are not just immediately converted. It's not so simple. There's all kinds of requirements. I mean, everyone thinks these hotels can be converted tomorrow. Yeah. Having yeah. done this kind of work, I know for a fact it's not going to be a tomorrow thing. So. And this is all under negotiation. And in, in other words, if a hotel is targeted by the state, it still has to be negotiated. There's no it's eminent about domain. By the state. It's, about, it's about a developer, for profit or not for profit, right. trying to make a deal with right. an owner. There's no right. eminent domain involved here. No, no. Which you know makes it all negotiation. Can I ask yeah. like a sidebar question on the hotels in our district? Um, I have come to be aware that a lot of them are doing day rentals, like day rate rentals. Mm -hmm. like four hours in uh, in a room. I haven't noticed that in Chelsea. <laughs> oh, you oh, have, trust it's me. Ha it's ha there's a whole app you can go on if you in want. In the West oh. 20s, it's a party scene, yep. Yeah, so are is this, is that a legitimate use of hotels under their zoning or guidance or are we well, just letting them get away with it because of the pandemic or is it? Let me, let me use the phrase that has been historically used. You mean a hot cheap motel? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I mean, like, they're all hot cheap motels now, apparently. Yes. So um, this is a new thing the NYPD is engaging with. They've been meeting with owners because there are specific multiple uses of a room in one day, or there are floating parties that are going to certain hotels in our district. Yeah. It's a new phenomenon. It solely re comes out of, out of COVID. And just so people know, it's a tri-state item where in the tri-state area, certain hotels have become party scenes where blocks of rooms are being rented for parties. Of course, not yeah. any, any COVID stuff at all. So yes, it's becoming an issue, Dale, and it's sort of emerging bit by bit by the I surrounding mean, the, it, is, it isn't the budget. I mean, the New Yorker is on day stay, which is one of these apps. So it's not mm -hmm. like, it's not exactly like the budget hotels are only doing it. But like the budgets are the bigger ones, yeah. Yeah. What's it called, Dale? Day stay? It's called day stay. Thanks. Okay, let's not have our eyes too much tonight. <laughs> you have some people from the public waiting. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 I asked before, but we weren't through it. Are there any other questions from the committee? Anyone else? Last shot. All right, let's the Q&A. You had one question, Joe, from John Mudd. There are a variety yes. of... Uh, or there are a variety of levels of supportive housing. Are you lumping all supportive housing together? Yeah, there's no lumping. Supportive housing is housing with services. And that's the issue we're talking about here. That if a housing, if housing requires social services, it's a social service use. And that's what designates it as supportive housing. Okay, and then you have one question. Brian yeah. Weber, Jesse, can you bring Brian over, please? Doing so now. Brian, go ahead. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks for bringing me over. Um, I can't top Lowell with his procedure today, but I'm, I'm vax, so I am I just got my second dose and I'm a little bit out of it, so please bear with me. Um, thank you so much for that thoroughly detailed presentation, Joe. I've been speaking to you offline at length about this, and, and this really helps clarify some things. Uh, before we go to my one question about the maps, um, I just wanted to ask a question regarding affordable housing. Uh, we talk about diversity of income bands. Uh, is it appropriate to request a diversity of um, type of unit, studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedrooms? Um, yes, I, yes. So, so mm -hmm. let's- yeah. We missed that, sorry. That's okay, yeah. so Good let's point. add that in. Um, and I, I guess uh, my question regarding maps, um, <laughs> as you know, I'm, I'm uh, pretty intimately knowledgeable of, of the West 30s and all the hotels there at this point, since I gathered the data on those. Um, what I was confused about in um, the one map where you had the overlapping circles of, on 36th, 37th, and 35th, um, Obviously, we have Praxis, 100 beds. We have Fountain House, an additional 30 beds. That is 130 total between those two consent, uh, radii. Um, what is to prevent 
uh, setting up a 20 bed shelter next to say the methadone clinic on 35th street? Well, because we have, we have the criteria saying it can't be on the same block front on the, on the same block. It wouldn't be on the oh. same block front. That would be on 35th street. You have Praxis on 36th and Fountain on 37th. So that's where I, I was a little bit confused about that. If, if, you, if, you, if, you have, if you have a facility on a block, you would not be able to put another facility on that block. So are you defining block as uh, we a change? We, we, we covered we, this, Brian. We covered this very early on. The yeah, language right. is going to say on any street between two avenues or on any under, avenue. Under, understood. Under, understood. So I'm just posing a hypothetical question. On West 35th Street, we have room for another 20 beds. Right. And, and so the criteria reads, it's one facility of social services on any street between two avenues or any avenue between two streets. <laughs> Therefore, you could not, even though there's a capacity for more beds, you could not put them on that street. Okay. I'm on that block. I'm still a little bit confused about that, but um, I will take your so word Brian, for it and have Brian, you if I, if I may help. On 35th Street between uh, 8 and 9, there are no uh, facilities, right? Currently, no, there's, there's a methadone. One. Currently. Yeah. So therefore, they, there could be a facility oh. of 20, of 20, uh, 20 beds. beds. I, I understand so, what you're saying, because there's a social service facility that would preclude additional right. beds. I completely understand now. Thank you for clarifying that. Right. Um, uh, I think it's great work. I think perhaps you might want to consider uh, including your maps with uh, the letter that explains. No, no, it. We, no we, we, we certainly will. I think part of this is we're trying to get the words to work properly. And that's what this committee is trying to do finally now, to make sure we express it well. So yeah. even after we write it, we're going to send it around to everybody to look at to make sure we got it okay. properly worded. All right. Um, uh, thank you. I, I think this, this answers a lot of, uh, of questions I had. All right, another hand just went up from the public, but the person is not identified and I'm not gonna call on someone who doesn't identify themselves. Um, so if you wanna type your name in and identify yourself, we can move you over. Otherwise, I'm going back to the panel here, Ms. Brute. So are we uh, addressing the current uh, interim shelters and saying, okay, we have two on a block and um, can both of them become permanent? or um, one of them would have to follow under that rule? No, I, I, actually, Christine, those shelters would put everything way out of whack. And there's always the understanding with DHS when they said recently as, I guess, Maria, what, just last week that they intend to move them back. So you can speak to that, Chris, uh, Maria? Uh, yes, uh, our meeting was last Wednesday, which I'll talk more um, about shortly, but um, they did mention that the leases, you know, they have a, they only have a six month lease. The leases are six months at a time. So it's not going to become, they are not going to become permanent sites. All right. And, and they also were very clear that they really don't prefer the shelters, the residents in these shelters, in these locations, that they don't I, work as well as the congregate shelters. That was a big push. That they yeah, about us. five years ago, DHS um, came about with an initiative or a campaign or whatever you call it, where they were gonna have all of their residents move out of hotels and into permanent facilities, so. Now, I'm not saying, Christine, that they're, that they're managing this in an expedited way, don't get me wrong on that. No, 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 well, I'm just I'm yeah. just asking whether the, right. the process would, uh, et cetera. So then let me do a quick recap of the, the items we came up with tonight. We have the clarification that it's any street between two avenues or any avenues between two streets, uh, that we're gonna make a note that it's a, about affordable housing that the the radii really pertain to the shelters and supportive housing and housing with services as opposed to the straight affordable housing. And we're gonna make more clarification that it's about transparency for community review like Jessica met, uh, mentioned. We're gonna note why we want the supportive housing to be part of a larger affordable housing building to promote integration to the community. The uh, uh, nine, item 995 uh, by Density of Social Services or supportive housing, the conversion to focus only on new affordable housing, that'll go up into the general principles. And then we're gonna put an additional there about range of apartment sizes mm -hmm. also. Have I, have I captured all of our comments? Yeah. Yep, okay. 
So then we need to uh, vote on this as it's, it's going to come from both land use committees. But I think exec should affirm what we're doing tonight. So get on the agenda as a joint uh, resolution. All right, then I'll entertain a motion. Motion. Second. All right, all those in favor of approving the report of the joint committees. Aye. Anyone, Aye. Anyone opposed? Anyone present not eligible otherwise not voting? All right, that passes unanimously. Thank you all very much. Joe, Joe. Betty, that was an unbelievable Amazing job. job. Bravo. Unbelievable job. That should be a template for many, many community boards, really. Okay, yes. I'm gonna move. A lot on. of people working together, seriously. A lot working together in the field. Right, we'll keep moving, folks. Um, we have a discussion next related to this on the existing temporary hotel shelters, Maria. This one's yours, I believe. Yeah, um, well, also, do you have um, on the agenda, I'm sorry, I don't have it up in front of me, the social, uh, talking about the social workers in terms? No, you can yeah. combine the two. Yeah, no, they're not, it's not a separate item. You can just, you could just include that in your report, I think. All right, so there's good news and not so good news. I'll start with the not so good news. To me, it's not so good. So <laughs> last Wednesday at our, so we've been having DHS monthly meetings since October um, of 2020. And um, I would say this past month, so last week, uh, uh, CB4 really harped on DHS about having coming up with a plan. Um, what is the plan? Uh, even if it's tentative, what is their plan to return to their congregate sites? Um, not only to relocate folks back to their regular normal sites, but also because we have three congregate sites in our district. Um, but DHS has no plan. Um, and Beyond that, uh, what I wanted to share was that um, each month what we discuss, I don't remember the last time I updated you guys, so I'll just tell you broadly that every month what we discuss are the social services that are in place currently, the security, including perimeter checks, move outs to permanent housing, transfers to other sites, um, the testing and the vaccines that are happening, the number of complaints and the outcome of the complaints, and CB4 has created a form so that when people complain to us, they have to fill out a form and we report on that at the meeting as well. Um, uh, the other thing we also uh, focused on, I would say last week is also about communication and the lack of it from DHS uh, and how challenging that has been, including around incidences that have been reported to us. Um, I, I would say that basically they said they're gonna talk to the higher ups about the plan to move back and get back to us about that. And ultimately that they'll do better about communication. There was some pushback about, well, we can't tell you about incidences because of privacy issues. We talked about it in a general way. We don't need details of who specific people are but we need information, um, bless you. And is there anything else, Jesse, that I'm forgetting that might be super important? No, um, you hit on most of everything. I mean, I think we've been relatively feeling like there's been a good continuous line of communication, um, you know, with them. And I think the, um, they, I will say the providers do report every month on specific incidences and specific um, complaints that they get. And so that's helpful and productive and making sure that that's what we're hearing out on the street, um, you know, and in other places. But I think we unfortunately had a series of, you know, violent incidences that all involved the sh different sh shelter residents that from different shelters. And they're, they're just, you know, the the, 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 the cracks in the system showed and there was just no feedback, no un understanding. I mean, I will say, fortunately, what we did here finally, though, was good stuff that in mm -hmm. one incidence, the shelter at 37th Street that in, where in which the security basically ignored uh, a, a, an attack that might be even still be investigated as a hate crime. And we're not 100% sure uh, those those security guards have been removed and, and, and uh, new protocols have been put in place. Um, and then and all of the other incidences of the, of the individuals that have either they are under arrest and 
uh, or if they are there, if they're out, they have been transferred, so they're no longer in the district. But um, yeah, so but I think Maria really did a good job of kind of <laughs> reiterating that sort of everybody has a plan. Everybody is at least working on a plan. Every industry has a plan for return. <laughs> and we are just Even there's nothing. Ones. There's nothing back, and, and I just expressed really my concern about this summer. I think this summer, you know, we're talking about last summer was, if everybody remembers last summer, <laughs> was a little crazy, right? With alcohol being being sold on the streets and everything like that. I think we have now, we have a bunch of, a number of folks vaccinated. We're going to have a number of folks, uh, you know, the alcohol is still going to be there. The drugs are certainly there. We know the drugs are there. Um, and it's, you know, I'm, it's concerning. And I'm, I'm just as concerned for the client's safety uh, and then as anybody else. So I, you know, it's going to be. I'm, I'm wondering if, I'm wondering if we should use our subpoena power and bring DHS in front of the Housing, Health and Human Services Committee and make this public. Well, I want to give a, another note. And Marie and I had a conversation with Barbara Blair from the Garment Yeah, Center. I was just going to add that. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, this was really disturbing. Uh, she actually had a, she had a discussion. Barbara had a discussion with Steve Banks from homeless services. And she asked specifically, what is the metric for people returning? We all expected to hear it's about vaccinations and shelters in order to get the population vaccinated to go back safely to congregate living. He said that, that DHS is looking at the overall vaccination rate for the city of New York as a metric, which I don't understand at all because everything that I'm doing, every industry is focused on itself and mm -hmm. it's, it's circumstances and how you can bring people back together safely. So this is a real serious disappointment. I think we need to raise that uh, with DHS uh, directly, low because that's a that's a crazy metric, you know. All right. Well, well, that's what I was saying. If we could bring if we bring them in and ask them to come present this before your committee, if they present, then we can write a letter out of the committee. Um, they can hear it in person, and then we can follow it up with a letter. And if they refuse, it gives us the space to write a letter saying, you're hiding from us, this is nonsense. Well, can okay, I so ask you, Lo, does it make sense to for a letter to come out of exec for us to pass at full board? We or? could, but I, I, I'd rather give them the chance to address this publicly mm -hmm. um, if okay. they want, you know, if they want to. I mean, because that, that your, your monthly meetings are just us, DHS, and the electeds. Mm -hmm. So let's let them say this publicly. Um, I mean, I realize that this Zoom is up on YouTube and anyone can find it. No, but that's a good um, idea. I would give them a chance to say this publicly um, and let them hear from the public, not only from the committee um, about this. And, you know, and if they refuse to come to the committee, then we've got an opportunity to say that, that this is what we understand but you refuse to discuss this publicly. So let's give them a chance at least to, you know, defend themselves before we go after them. That would be my thought. Is there any reason we can't just do a letter from exec publicly inviting them to the next meeting of, of the Housing, Health and Human Services Committee? Would you invite them by letter instead of just picking up the phone? Well, I'm thinking I want to create a record and make a public, make a public statement here because it's really disturbing that Maria reported basically, even after all these horrible incidents we've had, it's as if they don't exist for DHS, which I'm just at a loss on. Right. I, I, I am not opposed to that. I just want to make sure we give them a chance yeah, to course. defend themselves publicly before we go on record. If you want to say that, you know, we were, you know, this is what we've understood and we would like you to clarify this for the public, please come to the meeting. I have no problem with a letter along those lines. I would just invite them saying, we want you to get, give us the plan for reintegration to congregate shelters, just like that. Jesse, you're making I, place. My only concern burn. about that, Joe, is they're not gonna come because they're not gonna have a plan. <laughs> well, then when I know, they, but, but when they don't I mean, come, Jesse, when they duck us, it gives us the opportunity to write another letter that says, you know, your, your failure to, to, you know, present a plan makes us believe there is no plan, you know, what the hell are you doing? Right. Well, maybe instead okay. of the plan, what you are asking is to give them the criteria. That's the only thing you want them to present. 
No, you know, because the plan is a whole big thing about moving people, having buses, etc. The only thing you want to know is what are the criteria. The criteria for return. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because okay. it's a much narrower discussion. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I think something, else, I, I, Bert, I see your hand up, but something else that just came to my mind, something that I should have added about the vaccinations is that they were giving the J&J &J vaccines on site since um, I believe late February or early March. Uh, obviously they had to pause that. So they're trying to get folks to return to the hub that's at DRC. And you know, they can provide transportation and everything, but it's challenging to get staff and residents vaccinated. There's increase in numbers and there's progress. But for example, one site said there's been progress and she was very happy to you know, report that uh, I think it was 12 staff members had been vaccinated. Um, so- I mean, there's you know, Javid next door. Yeah, it's not about ex it's the vaccine access, hesitancy, it's about Christine. hesitancy, yeah. yeah. So, Let's, let's um, I saw Bert had his hand up. I was going to go to Bert. Yeah, and in terms of this alleged plan, which doesn't exist according to Jesse, it doesn't sound like they have a plan. But in what well, you mentioned before, their leases, you had said they had six month leases. Before. Yes. So, okay, if they have six, but they're not, do we have any idea when they expire and do they intend to re sign them? And I assume they don't expire at the same time because they didn't, right. they didn't we sign know, the Bert. leases. The it short is. answer is we know nothing because they're not transparent. Okay, so right. we really don't have, no, have any information about this. But, right. you know, all the shelters were brought into the temporary, they, it's called reduction density sites, were brought into our district in May and some in June, so. Yeah, May and June, right. Yeah. All right, so we, we will send a letter from exec inviting DHS to appear before Housing, Health, and Human Services. Who's going to draft the Maria, Joe? You I will. And All send right. it over to Joe. All right. Yeah. And then send it to me. And we'll go out from under my signature for exec. Okay. And just one last thing oh, for Jesse. Oh, oh, what, oh. All right. Let's, you need a motion. And you need oh, a I'm so moved. Second. <laughs> I, I, Je Jesse, just to confirm, I, I, I need a motion. Thank you. Jesse. Doesn't this count as an administrative letter, letter since we're just inviting them? If you're asking the full board to vote on it, you're voting it out of committee. If you're I'm, just I'm not it, asking anyone to vote on it, I'm asking to send an administrative letter inviting yeah. them to appear before committee. But then, okay, but just to clarity's sake, Joe wanted it on record. It's not going to the full board. It's not going to full board, no. This is going to DHS, inviting them to appear before Housing, Health, and Human Services. Sure, that's fine. You're voting on an administrative letter on a topic that you guys have written endlessly about, I think. And I don't need, <laughs> I don't need a vote on it. You don't need a vote on it. I thought, we, I thought Joe was looking to have a fine, full fine. board vote on it, so that's why I was no, saying. No, I'd rather the letter go out tomorrow. That's... And if they don't, appear, I don't know what Maria's day is like tomorrow, but sure. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's going to be tonight. My point being is if they decline the invitation, yeah, yeah. then something goes to full board. Right. And full board votes out a letter saying, what the hell are you doing? Right. We can actually do something at, at the main meeting. Right. Yes. Okay. Um, Thank you. Just for, just for Jesse and Maria. There are two locations now that are really becoming problematical. One is the canoe on 36th Street. I am now seeing serious drinking out of bottles and lap and like boombox stuff happening there a lot. Okay. And that's definitely from the uh, shelters on 36th. Mm -hmm. The other one, which is new, it's from NICA. They are now, uh, there's a group of people on 40th next to the fish market. And it is a growing group of people drinking, smoking, and they identified themselves as from the shelter down the block to me today. Okay. They told me, I'm homeless from down the block in that shelter. Give me some money. Are those the windshield washers? No, no. Nope. nope. One of the, I, will, I will say two things, and I want to make sure Maria hit touches on the good news, too. Yeah, yeah. Good. I didn't forget. <laughs> I was going to let Joe one finish. Of, <laughs> one of the big things that a number of them, the number of the providers are reporting and uh, is that and I'm not saying these are the situations for the you're, what you're reporting on Joe yet. It may be though, is that they transfer folks, you know, who are not following the good neighbor policy. And, but those folks come back, <laughs> you know, like, again, it speaks to the, the neighborhood that this area is in. We've always known this, that that area between Penn, Port Authority and Penn Station is between eighth and ninth is always hopping right and in the summer it's doubly hopping and so i will just say like part of this is that you know the some of the 
a number of folks have, have reported on this as, as an issue is that folks are just coming back after they're being moved to different locations out of borough. Um, so, um, but I'll just leave it at that. But Maria, but when you say they, they transfer in the neighborhood, do they transfer them back to their original sites? No, no to an, another no. shelter. It's another well, shelter. it depends on, it's a, Bert, it depends on the provider. You can transfer internally to another site you have, or you can send okay. them back to through the system. And they, but if there's good, eventually, if they have good behavior, quote unquote, over there, they'll come back. No, 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 no. It's not. It's not like a. You know, it just they just move them, and I mean, obviously, they'll have to. You know, uh, <laughs> um, it's a permanent transfer. There, it's, permanent it's transfer. Okay. okay. This is not. This these locations are particularly. Uh, uh, problematic for their for the providers they don't want to be there either so they any any problem they are willing they are i think they want to be able to just get it out of the just out of gotcha. our area before Thanks. and so but the what they what they can control is if these folks are coming back you know during the day and it, it's it, i mean I, they you know they have some level of control but they you know it's not something they can completely just shut down automatically coming back on their own steam is what you're right saying. exactly it's yeah and I'll jump in here to mention some of the good news is that um, with some prodding, I guess I would say from Josephine um, and I having discussions about uh, social work students at uh, sh shelters in the district, specifically the temporary locations um, and possibly family sites. We had a meeting with Acacia, CB4 and Fordham University and Acacia is open to have two or three social work students in their sites in CB4 to begin in September. Um, and Fordham indicated that the students would be second year students, which is good. And uh, it's unclear if it would be virtual or on site or a hybrid, um, but I just wanted to share that, that, that good news. Any questions for Maria about any of the hotel shelter topics? Jesse. I'm sorry, it's not a question for Maria. I, I, I neglected to say this earlier, but I wanted to give a huge shout out to Savannah at Joe's office who attends the meetings with us and writes the minutes. I've included all of them in the Dropbox. They are, it's a lot of information. We're in an hour meeting. We're running through six or seven providers, multiple topics. And so I really appreciate Savannah sticking with it and, yeah. and participating. Yeah, thank you for that, Jesse, because I know how, I know Savannah does so much and I forget to uh, show appreciation like you all do, but I've dropped by and given her stuff, so it's good. Um, <laughs> and there was one more thing I wanted to share about the sites and I lost it. Um, I apologize, it'll come back to me. All right, it'll come back to you. We'll come back to you, Marie, if it comes back to you. In the meantime, I'm gonna move on. The next item on the agenda is MCB4 sidewalk condition survey. Madame Bertay. Yes, Jesse, can you uh, bring up the screen? Yeah, give me one moment. Right. So Transportation Committee and Dale and uh, also helped by the ACES Committee and Alan Oster and uh, created a survey to ask all our neighbors and even larger uh, population in the city how are the sidewalks and what are their perception of, of the, the, the job of the city. So we got a response from uh, 960 people and uh, I wanted to share with you the result. Um, uh, and I, I, uh, I, Christine, if you have it um, ready to go, I've allowed you to share your screen. I mean, it's just, um, it's. I'm moving, my, my computers are moving very slow right now. Um, okay. I'll have it in a second. Um, yeah, Christine, Christine, while you're doing that, I think we should give a, a big thank you to Blake who did a lot of work on this also. Yes. Um, on the technical end and some very good ideas and formatting everything. Yeah, that is true. Blake was very helpful. Blake is awesome. Was this an online survey you did? Yes. And, and how did you distribute it? Uh, we sent it to, um, hold on one second. I'm trying to find where my, where, where didn't, didn't the office uh, We distributed it on, on all um, 
mailings, I mean, the community board, all the elected officials mm -hmm. on uh, Twitter, on, uh, we put it in the newspapers, the local newspapers, and um, I mean, every, every way we could think of. Our Democratic Club. Yes. Let me see the share screen. Can it, I? Yeah, that is not what I want you to see. Uh oh. <laughs> All right. I have it ready if you let me. Yeah, yeah, it. you can do it. You should be able to share your screen. I, I allowed you to do it. Oh, I got it. No. Okay. Everybody can see that. Yeah. So that shouldn't be very long. It's a long analysis, but I'll show you just a summary of what is what came out of that. And uh, I want to go as full presentation. Right. Here we go. So we got 960 respondents. Oh, we also send it to um, ADA uh, organizations and 10% um, responded, which had disabilities and 80% are in zip codes, which are associated with CB4. The average respondent was 52 years old and we got 4,909 comments, which are very much about specific locations or uh, reactions, etc. So we have a, a wealth of uh, comments here. So what is the first, um, Thing. I should probably kill this, but anyway, uh, overall quality of the sidewalk. The first qu question was, what do you think of the quality of the sidewalks? And overall people thought 48% thought they were poor, which means 52% thought they were okay or better. In CB4, it was 49%, but for the ADA population, they thought 64% thought they were poor or very poor. The second question was, what do you, how do you rate the city's job of maintaining sidewalks under a normal condition, which means not snowy? Mm -hmm. And overall, 57% said it's poor, very, very poor. In CB4, 59%, and in ADA, uh, 68%. And then the next question was about clearing the snow from the walking infrastructure. And overall, uh, the 62% MCB4 was the same way and ADA thought it was 69% was poor and very poor. So what were the major problem which were identified? The biggest problem, so the number I'm showing is when people said, uh, I see that, that situation often, very often or all the time. And the first number is the total and the second number is the ADA population. So ponding at the corners is the major issue that people see with uh, the infrastructure. 79% thought it was dirty. The, the sidewalks were dirty very of, often or very often. Uh, people complain about ramps, 50%, uh, 65%, and obstruction, 63%. But we can see that ponding is really the big, big, big problem. Uh, when generally speaking. These are the, the places where people re reported where ponding takes place. Uh, the brown is dirty sidewalk here. The blue are the ponding locations, the most frequent ponding locations. The um, sidewalk repairs is, is red and congestion is in red. So that tells you where people reported those, those issues. Under the snow conditions, uh, ramp and corners were again the problem. 70%, 74% and 77% said they were often, often impassable. And bus access where uh, indeed the ADA population said it was often narrow or impassable. And then the next major problem is that 63% or 76% observed that within 24%, the, 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 the snow is not cleared from buses and for, from ramp. And 77% observed that the lengths, the full lengths of the, uh, of the block was not cleared. So if you have a store which is not clearing, it says that for 25%, it's not cleared. 
And these were the, the, the location reported by the different respondents, as you can see in a lot of places here. And we had indeed some, some response in Harlem and some response uh, lower in the village, some response in uh, Brooklyn, et cetera, but the overall was very consistent. Then the interesting thing was what we asked whether they were willing to report and to whom. So 31% of the people had reported under normal conditions and under snowy condition only 12%. And they mostly, most of them reported to uh, 311. And then the responsiveness is pretty horrible. Uh, you know, people reported that 79% of the issues were not resol resolved under normal conditions and 68% under snowy conditions. <laughs> and as a result, the satisfaction with the 311 level of service, 80% uh, responded that they were very dissatisfied or dissatisfied with the response. So there are many, many other, and we, we have put some quotes of who, who, are, you know, who responded, have found reporting issues doesn't help, never have a satisfactory from 311. And then people say, I didn't know I could report snow condition. So now we have all the details and I'm not going to um, get to all of that. Um, but I think the idea is now to uh, send a response to everybody and then to have a letter to, uh, that will go to the full board uh, for approval to request from the, uh, uh, from the administration an explanation of what they are doing for those uh, uh, situations and why do we have people so, um, so, so disgruntled with it. What do we expect to hear from sanitation, Christine, that they just don't have the money? No, we, we, we're going to send a letter saying, uh, uh, you know, the, the, it's not going to go to sanitation, it's going to go to the deputy mayor. And we're going to say, you know, we want to understand and you do a deep dive of why uh, people are uh, reporting those things. And what we are going to find, we already know the answer is that the, uh, the, uh, sanitation doesn't consider that the sidewalk is their job. It's not. And that the city doesn't consider that that you know, sidewalk is their job. And therefore that's going to give us a platform to start advocating for those things to become their job. Alan? Uh, Christine, sh should the letter also include something in regards to um, 311? And, in, and the dis yes. dissatisfaction that folks have and, and it was su supposedly they were going to revamp it and whatever, right. or, or just something about the dissatisfaction that people have with it, how 311 is. Yes, we'll, we'll, we'll add that. Uh, I think what, you know, 311, the dissatisfaction with 311 is because 311 passed it to the, to the agencies and the agencies do nothing. So, it, you know, it's more about what is happening from the agencies, but, but I think you have a good point. We'll add that to the letter. Right. Because the, only, the, the common response is it's been looked at, it's been taken care of, it's closed. Right. We, nev we never get how was it closed, why was it closed, right. what have they done? You know, that, why it was it. not closed, not done. Right. Yeah. Christine? Yes? I'm just a little confused. With the slide that you have up, it says how is the sidewalk surface, but what is... Oh, forget about this. This is the detail of, you know, this, this is about the repairs on the sidewalk. Yeah, how often people trip. Right, right. So people on that subject, people said it was pretty good, which we reported in the first uh, slide. I, I do think, Christine, I'm very, I'm very impressed with all these, yeah. what was it, 4,909 responses and putting it all together. But I think if we ever take a position in a letter, we have to be very 
clear that we understand at least where the responsibilities are currently. We right. may, sanitation is not responsible for cleaning the sidewalks. No, I know. Property owners are. Right. The property owners, I'm not sure about who's responsible for the physical sidewalk. I, the way I see it, when people put a new sidewalk in, it's the private people, it's the property owners who are putting a sidewalk in. It's not the city coming and putting a sidewalk. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know for sure. I don't know for sure. So before- That's this, accurate, Bert. That's accurate. This no, is, I, as, a, as a general I, problem, yes, we have problems with snow removal. As a general problem, yes, we have some problems with sidewalks that are falling apart. But we have to also know that who's responsible for at the way it is structured now, who's responsible. Then we can say this system maybe is not working. Right. And maybe we have more faith in if the Department of Sanitation would be responsible, which I think is an impossible job, giving it the Department of Sanitation to clean everybody's sidewalk in New York City. You know, that, to this to the to your point, Bert. Um, it part of the Christy, I don't know if you saw that last language. Yes, I, I did. Yeah, it's the there there were questions raised in the in the letter that we're drafting about the coordination of all the different responsible parties, such as DSNY, such as DOT, such as the private owners, because what we're seeing is the work is not coordinated and that's contributing to the conditions. Who would be the coordinator? Well, I don't know if there would be a coordinator per se, or if DSNY, for instance, would provide guidelines or guidance to, you know, snow removal protocols so that they're not dumping snow on each other's, you know, on each other's <laughs> back and forth. I mean, yeah. Well, the only so thing Bert, Bert, the, to answer your question, we, we know, a we know who is responsible of the city. That's right. in terms of the surface of the roadway, which is the city's responsibility. Right. Also, it's the city's responsibility for the sewage, the grates, to be open, to be clear. And I know years ago, sanitation used to have people going out and cleaning, if I remember correctly, from my youth. That hasn't happened probably since the 1970s. No, D DDP cleans those. Right. DEP does it now? So, Bert, okay. Bert I, let me, I have done a very detailed research on who is responsible for what Good. and the level of service. I have all this information. Right. Unfortunately, it's, it's, a, it, it's in, incredibly complicated and incredibly uh, detailed. So we need to find questions to ask the administration at a higher level. To, what we want to ask them in, is to do a deep dive into who is responsible and how it's happen, working today so that they can come back and we can identify whether things could be changed or this is the way it is and we need to have a legislation to change it. All right, I, I've got a question, Christine. You're gonna be presenting this at committee and then it'll come back with a letter to full. No, we have already presented that committee and we okay. have the letter, a draft letter ready for the board. Okay, so the draft letter is ready already for-, for Right, but we'll, we'll change that based on our comments, obviously. Okay. Um, uh, I think um, we had generic language about coordination. And I think Bert's examples, like we can get into some of the specific details, the specific instances and who who's accountable for them and ask specific questions. For example, the ponding versus snow removal. Right. And we should, and, and I think we definitely flag DSNY and DOT, but I guess we also need to flag DEP and um, yeah. Okay. All right, are there uh, any I questions? Just something? Oh, sorry. I, I just wanna, I, 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 sup, I do think I agree with Bert, Bert a little bit. I think from for the layman's perspective, when you hear snow removal, everybody thinks sanitation. And I think that's just something I want to make sure we clarify. And I haven't read the letter. If you've, if you've sent it to us yet, Christine and Dale, I apologize. But no. I, I just think it's just something we want to make sure we're clarifying early on that while we are saying snow removal and all of this stuff, we, we do recognize that 
the area in which we're talking about isn't actually, you know, directly related to the, like, it's not included in the snow plan or anything along those lines. Right. It's not, DSNY is not responsible. Right. Not to say that they shouldn't be in the future, right? I, I, I'm just saying currently. So, because uh, I, when I read the survey the first time, I, I, it took me a second to realize what you guys were asking. And it, it, so I could imagine someone from the public, you know. I mean, the bottom so, line is, you're, we're all pointing to this kind of balkanization and we're gonna try to address it in this letter and say, what can be done about this where it's falling down? Right, because because my, my issue on snow removal is not so much the sidewalks, but when you get to the corners and you get the ponding on the corner, that's now in the street for the most part. So that would be DSNY. Yes. But it backs up onto the sidewalk and then it's not DSNY. So who's responsible for clearing the street corners? Right. That's, really the, that's, that's really the biggest issue. That's to the point. Yeah. Right. Exactly. That that's the big that's the that's the big question here. All right. Um, are there any other questions from the committee? Alan. Yeah, but I think technically you're not supposed to put snow into the street. Yeah. Right. So it somehow go, comes back to the owner, property owner, or somebody, but you know, so. No, but it's extremely. It's a very complicated, confusing. Right. You know. right. It's very complicated because, in fact, what's happening is that the corners and the bus stop are very bad because of sanitation. Who is pushing all the roadway snow onto the corners and onto the bus stop and onto the sidewalk, and then you have the owners which are supposed to remove the snow, but then there is a mountain of snow. And they are not supposed to put it in the in the in the roadway. So these are what Dale is saying is that that coordination, that understanding of how people work with each other, I think is very important and it's not working today. And we need right. to we are trying to get a platform to clarify it. Right. And what whatever whatever happened to snow emergency streets? Used well, to be snow I don't know about that. Right. right. All right. Jessica. Okay. Yes, hi. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I'm in a bit of transit, but I just wanted to raise that in an observation that I'm listening to the entire presentation, which I think reflects amazing work and so many 9,000 respondents is incredible. But just in the narrative, no one mentioned accessibility, which is obviously a huge issue that this buildup on sidewalks or ponding or streets, like we're talking about the solution, which is great, but accessibility really is a key issue. And I'm not saying that will necessarily lead us to the solution of who's responsible. I just want to make sure that in any letter or any discussion yeah. of this topic, that that is first, like, Absolutely. is really in yeah, the forefront. We have, we, we have That's that. Absolutely right. I mean, it's somewhat embedded in the survey because it, the way the, because of the way it centers the voices of um, people with disabilities. But you're right. Absolutely. That, just in this, I just mean in this discussion in for the, the last text. twenty no, minutes, it. it hasn't no, come I, up. I agree. We should definitely block that out in the letter itself as well. Is Maria? Okay. No. Any any other questions from the committee? Thank you, everyone, for the feedback. All right, you've got one question from the. Oh no! All right, good. We're covered then. Um, let's move on then. Okay. Next item. Thanks is, for the comments. Yep. Next item is the Empire Station Complex project. Um, I'll take this one. Um, there was a community advisory council that ESD had put together. And then in um, where, where Jeffrey was representing us. And then as part of the budget, the governor put over a billion dollars in to fund the plan that he had put forth. And the only review it had was the community advisory council um, where they basically told us who our rep would be. And they, the, um, they meaning ESD and the governor, um, are doing this under a general project plan, so it would not come for ULERP review. At the point that it hit the budget, it started raising major concerns for CB5 in particular, since seven of the eight sites are in CB5. We joined with them and the local elected set up and paid attention. Um, thanks to the good work of Assembly Member Godfrey's office in particular, um, the money in the budget was designated only for below grade repairs. 
So it can be used for development of the tracks and Penn Station, but not for the eight super talls that the governor wanted to build in Midtown. At that point, ESD um, heard the cries from CB4 and CB5 and expanded the Community Advisory Council um, and reformulated it. Um, Paul, Jeffrey, Christine, and myself have now joined Jeffrey representing us. There are an equal number of CB5 representatives and community groups have been added to the Community Advisory Council. The Community Advisory Council, new re reformulated Community Advisory Council will be having their first meeting tomorrow. Um, we, because of the size of the new um, CAC, ESD asked for a steering committee of which I have participated. And we basically put together the agenda for the various meetings. Um, I'm still not optimistic because it's ESD and a general project plan that they are going to um, heed the voices of the community as fully as they should. But they have been very curious as to what our working group has done with Port Authority for the bus terminal and for what our working group did with um, NYCHA. So hopefully that they're going to sit up and pay attention and we're not going to be inundated by eight super talls around Penn Station without a plan to redevelop Penn Station. Um, that's all I can really say right now because we've only had the steering committee meetings. We haven't had the full uh, first meeting of the new working group, of the new Community Advisory Council working group. Um, but I will keep you updated on that. Jeffrey, you wanna add something? I just wanna flag the um, importance of what we achieved <clears throat> as it relates to the state's process in the GPP. Once they hold their formal public hearing on the project, that's it. They're allowed to move forward with the GPP. Um, and the state gets to usurp all city guidelines and zoning regulations. The state so far has committed to not having its public hearing before June 30th, and they haven't set a date for that either. Um, so it was critical that we stop them from not having that hearing, and we've been successful in that thus far. They've actually committed to not having the public hearing until the, work, the uh, Community Advisory Council Working Group completes its work. And I let them know today that in addition to their public hearing, they were going to have to come to CB4 and present various committees that are impacted. They asked if we could do a joint meeting with CB5. CB5 wasn't represented at the steering group today. No one showed up for them. Um, and so we, we are going, to, they know they have to come to us in addition to holding their public meeting. Sorry, I didn't mean to step on you, Jeffrey. That's okay. I just wanted folks to know the importance of of what we have achieved thus far as well. All right, Bert. Just a question in terms of the process. Jeffrey, you said that once they do the final, whatever it is, and then the plan goes into effect. Now, is it all from the executive? Because it's a, the Empire State Development Corporation, or does the legislature have any input to slow it down, to move it around, other than moving parts of the budget. The budget is the lever that the legislature has. That's the only leverage they have is the budget. Yeah. And, and, and the 1.3 billion that was approved because of you know Dick's office in particular, they are not allowed to use that above grade. So it can't be used to develop the plan. Now, if they're bringing in developers to do this and they have been working with Vornado, um, the money may not all be coming from the state budget, but there is no state money right now allocated for anything other than renovating Penn Station. Okay. Paul? Well, to, to clarify that a little bit, the $1.3 billion is for below grade changes, which could be the block south of Penn Station if they decide that's where they're going to expand their tracks to. So, right, for, but that would be an expansion yeah. of Penn Station. That would be an expansion yeah. of Penn Station. But they can't, they can't use that for eminent domain to take the buildings above grade. They, that can, means they, can't, use, they can only they, use it to spend it below grade. So they can't so use they those can't use it for St. St. John the Baptist Church, but they can put the they can say put the train tracks underneath St. John the Baptist Church. Yes. Right, but they can't take out the church because that's it would be an above grade acquisition. 
that's the way the, the, the budget was passed. It could undermine the, the, the basement though. Yeah, it, it would. And, and, and the then building it, will collapse. Right, and then we have a DOB issue and et cetera, et cetera. But we basically, yeah. we basically put the brakes on this for now. Yeah. And yes. we've got two months basically to, you know, straighten them out and, and do what they need to do. Now we are working in conjunction with a lot of community partners and with community board five, but the sense I have gotten from ESD, for example, is that they want to hear what we have to say because they know we know how to do this. Um, so we, we have a voice at the table outsized to the impact of this project on CB4 right now, and we intend to use it. They wanted to add, a, just by way of example, they wanted to add a second CB5 member to the steering committee. And um, Marion asked me if I had an objection because they would have more representation on the steering committee than we did. And I said, don't worry about it. I got a big enough mouth for two people. So, you know, as long as I've got all of you behind me telling me what to say, you know, we're not going to, our voice will be heard. Lo, how often are those meetings? I'm sorry if you said it. They are going to it. take place weekly. And the agenda was circulated within the last half hour to the members of the uh, working group. So we set the agenda, the steering committee set the agenda for each meeting today. One of the big issues was whether or not Amtrak and New Jersey Transit would participate as a member of the working group. The compromise that was reached is that they are invited to all of the meetings where their input will be helpful, but they were not granted status as a full-fledged member of the working group because they have a partial conflict of interest in all of this. Any questions? Kit. Thanks, Lowell. Um, sorry for the background music, everybody. My three-year-old is next to me. Um, I actually wanted to ask about the trains. So one thing that ESD said was, you know, Amtrak, New Jersey Transit, Long Island Railroad, they all need to get together before there's an opportunity to move things forward with the planning underground. I'm just wondering if you can share any more context on where that process is um, and how, if it is stuck, it potentially gets unstuck because if this money has now been allocated to do work below ground, but there's an impasse about what that work should be, all right, we have not been privy to the discussions between the transportation partners, but the way the agenda has been set for the working group, there is discussion of these issues and the transportation partners, MTA, New Jersey Transit, have Amtrak have been you know, added to the agenda for those. So hopefully we will get some answers to those questions. We don't have them yet because the reformulated working group has not met as a whole yet. Anything else? Okay, thank you all very much. I remember what I wanted to say, Lo. Okay, let's go back a half hour. Go ahead, Maria. <laughs> um, actually, I wanted to propose that, uh, I know I saw an email about fellows, um, but I was thinking about CD4 having a social work intern. Um, all right, I'm, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna ask you to hold that because it yeah. can come up during Jesse's report and it'll fit in perfectly. Okay. All right, so next we move to the chair report and the small meeting report. Um, ongoing working groups and updates. Well, there's the Empire Station Complex working group and there's the Port Authority Bus Terminal working group. And those have continued to meet as I just indicated. Um, I think we had an update from Port Authority, the Port Authority group last month. Um, and then we, there's a, we have met, a group has met, that's not a formal working group yet with Friends of the High Line um, regarding the Highline East expansion, they will be coming to the Waterfront Parks and Environment Committee meeting. Um, am I right that they're coming in May, Jess Jeffrey? Yes, he's nodding. So that will be the first public hearing where the public gets access to this Highline East plan. Um, we did instruct, and I see Christine's hand up, we did instruct these, you know, ESD and Friends of the Highline to talk to the um, Hell's Kitchen South Coalition because they have, there are now conflict, conflicting plans for the eastern end of 30th Street between 9th and Dyer. 
Um, and so we, you know, made sure that they are working with the Hell's Kitchen South Coalition. And Christine, I assume you want to weigh in on that piece of it? Yes. If you don't mind, uh, we had a conference uh, Zoom on Friday and uh, the executive committee of the coalition. And it res the result of that is that we have three problems. One is we have conflict between uh, the high line, the proposed high line and, um, uh, you know, pedestrian safety and transportation priorities that the bid had put together. We have conflict between the High Line and the, the plan for HYHK for land use on the east side. And um, it's, you know, it's not clear that the High Line or the, the, um, uh, the ESD is planning to improve what is under that new High Line uh, and uh, improve um, because in, essentially they are creating a, a bridge there and we need all that, uh, all those things to be improved under it. So, uh, you know, the next, uh, the next step is going to meet with the uh, Port Authority. And I would suppose some people from the, B, the, the CB4 should meet with them as well. And I would recommend that in addition to park, they uh, present to transportation because there is a serious conflict between pedestrian <clears throat> safety and the proposal. Okay, yes, well, I'm sure, that will, I'm sure that will come up next Thursday. All right, hang on. Um, Betty, then Joe, then Alan. Yeah, just, just to add to that, um, Christine and I walked around that area because I wanted to understand some of the past work that Sam Schwartz did and their graphics that were given to Christine and others about different solutions that conflict with what the High Line is saying. And it's, it's a very serious um, conflicts and different solutions. So. I think with the way we last left it with um, the meeting we had on Friday was that we would um, maybe have a little small, small working group meeting and then have a larger meeting with more of the stakeholders. So it's, it's, it's it, and I think the folks that presented uh, we're respectful of that, and they wanted to continue the discussion on, on the matters that that were conflicting. Okay, Joe. Yeah, I just wanted I just want to offer. I don't think this thing is ready for prime time, honestly. Uh, out of our meeting with ESD and the friends of the High Line, we agreed that there should be a serious like sit down, work it through with the Port Authority, the Community Board, the BID, and Health Kitchen South Coalition, because it is, was quite frustrating that both the BID had done actual work and contracted a consultant, Sam Schwartz, to lay out an intersection, and the coalition had a report that was very specific on how this could be worked out, and none of that was thought about in advance. So the current plans for the, uh, for the, layout of the High Line extension would not, would create an obstacle for those plans to happen. And Tishman was also involved with this. So, I mean, we have to like, there's been a lot, there's been about a year and a half of work on this that was not taken into account when ESD moved ahead on this. So I'd ask both Jeffrey and you, Lowell, that maybe this is not ready for the public part yet, but get a working group, join, the, join a working group with ESD so we can really hammer these things out not to preclude the pedestrian safety improvements that we've all been working on to make happen. So the high line is not the tail wagging the dog, but vice versa. All right. And I would go one step, I'm sorry, I would go one step further is I would really would like ESD to pay for the pedestrian improvements. If they are going, course, to, the end. Right. If they are going to build something here, they should really make sure that what is below does work and is built at the same time. All right, I'm going to go to Alan. I'm going to preempt you so Jeffrey can respond to that. Yeah, just to comment, uh, Joe, I agree. Um, the issue is um, 
there's a real drive for this. And uh, it's, it's once again, getting ESD to actually stop and engage. So part of the problem is the High Line- Holly did, Holly did. Uh, yes, no, I get that, but the Holly issue- Holly did because we forced her to. Right. No, no, but, but she agreed further with us that there has to be a broader discussion before yes. they barrel it. So, and I, yes, part of the issue is, it's a public meeting, I'm gonna say it anyway. ESD doesn't wanna do a thorough community affairs process here. The High Line does and wants to be a part of that. And the High Line is coming to present the expansion to WPE. ESD is not, right? So there's a real distinction between um, like who's responsible, who's driving this, what's gonna make it happen. So I'm agreeing with you entirely, but I'm not sure that we should um, tell the High Line not to come and start talking about something that they're sort of being forced to do through ESD. Well, the High Line is getting, from information we got, $20 million granted from ESD for this project. And the last thing I wanna see is that the High Line, friends of the High Line be the stalking horse because their last comment was, it doesn't matter to them where the connection goes, they're interested in the thing working. And so our answer was, okay, then meet with everybody and talk about it. I just don't want it to be, let's wave the High Line flag for this great project without looking at the thing in totality and context. No, I, I, and I think I'm not trying to get any, to wave any, the High Line yes, flag. If I could jump in here, if I could jump in here for a second, if I could jump in here for a second, the reason I think this meeting should go forward at WPE is because this has never been aired publicly anywhere. And if once it's out there in the public, you know, not just in meetings with ESD and, and, you know, us or the Hell's Kitchen South Coalition or whoever, at that point, we can build a groundswell for saying, what the hell are you doing here? You need to sit and engage with the community. You can't just come in and impose a plan. So that's why I think it's important for this to, to get out there because there's never been a public meeting on this yet. But then we I should control the narrative of how it gets presented because you don't want, what I saw in this meeting was ESD put the high, friends of the High Line first to carry a ball that they weren't even that comfortable with carrying. And then when we push back saying X, Y, Z, A, B, C, then they were like, well, we can figure out so it's that kind of thing, Jeffrey, I'm just counseling like. Listen, I agree with you, Joe, it is, but it's also. Jeffrey, let me, let me say one more thing before you, you jump. The other thing we discovered there is that it's really not, that section is not going to be called an extension of the High Line. It's going to be a connector and it's not going to be built in the style of the High Line. It's going to be really a Built passage, of wood. Right? Something very different from the High Line, which is really interesting. It's going to be in wood. It's going to be totally different. So um, it's, it's also, there is also, there are also issues of pa uh, uh, pedestrian capacity there. They have a very narrow space. So all of those issues are interlocked. Uh, but I kind of subscribe to Lowell's uh, uh, strategy. Mm -hmm which says, let's make, let's make it public. And now everybody can say, wow, this is crazy, you know, and, and we go from there. And, um, and we could have them come to transportation and talk about all the transportation issues and have a letter about that. I mean, Jeffrey, one of the odd things was ESD kept saying, well, the Port Authority needs this alignment because they want to use it for parking of buses during the terminal reconstruction. And both Christine and I were like, come on now. For it to park 10 buses, you're not going to do a permanent $20 million, you know, $40 million improvement. You got to figure out the long term. So that's why I'm just saying, if, if you as the co-chair there could really make it clear this is an idea, as opposed to here's the wonderful thing, because it's not really figured out yet at all. That, that was no, my we, take. And we need, we need, as Joe says, we need a meeting with everybody in the room. It's just like a bowl yeah. and everybody is pulling and pushing for their piece of that bowl. And we need to really organize that and say, okay, where does it stop and, and where does it go? But I think, I mean, I think Lowell's strategy is good. Let's put it in the public. Uh, let's get it in transportation and let's people react and say, oh my God, what's going on? Great. All right, Jeffrey, you got your work cut out for you a week from Thursday. Alan, you have your- I hand. didn't hear a thing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Alan, 
there's, there's a presentation tomorrow at CCBA, uh, Highline New Connections. Yeah, when it's, when it's pitched like that, it's a Highline project. That's the problem. Alan, then maybe at CCBA tomorrow night, you can make clear that this is coming to WPE and this is not a fait accompli. But I have a question, you know, maybe no, maybe no answer to it, but what is the purpose for this, for this flyover over our streets? To make uh, Cuomo happy. It, it connects the, the, end, the western end of Moynihan through the uh, plaza opposite and then takes a turn and gets you to the High Line. It, it, so it, there is some so, like so that's to keep that's to keep people off our streets. Yeah. Well, exactly. it's to, it's to e, it's to connect. It's really to connect sure. Hudson Yards with Manhattan West. Exactly. Oh, so right. people, so people could get into Hudson Yards a little bit easier right. rather than walking on our streets right. and buying a hot dog whole, from a poor guy no, it's, it's trying to make a living. Right. And that if, you, if you think about Hudson Yards, Hudson Yards has that wall along Tenth Avenue with the side of the, the back of the mall. I'm not supposed to call it a mall with the back of the mall that faces west. So there's that corridor that kind of it's separates deep. the two, and the High Line would connect the two projects and connect it to Moynihan. It's also a way to feed people into whatever shops, right? And retail, exactly. They have at Brookfield, because yeah. right now, everybody, if you go in the High Line, it, they all walk right into whatever shops is there in Hudson Yards. So they second get all the retail third, activity yeah. from the High Line people. This is a way for Brookfield to get some of it. If you get right. enough people walking on the High Line because they want to go to the Moynihan, you know, station hall but and catch, their, that... catch their train to go up the Hudson Valley, that's bullshit. No, it's... but but for a moment, let, let, let's let's pull the bullshit away from it for a moment. It's a major ADA entrance to the High Line because you're at grade on you're Ninth right. Avenue, walking Thank from Manhattan West, right. taking the turn getting onto the High Line. So it does have a utility as the area develops, right? It doesn't mean that there's not a lot of, there's no, Brookfield would not do a $20 million contribution to this if they didn't feel they were gonna get something out of it, obviously. Clearly. So we just need to manage it and shape it so it functions better for the whole community, not just one piece, that's all. Exactly. Okay, agreed. Okay, anyone else on this one? All right, small meetings. Um, this is another one, uh, me and Christine, and who else was at the meeting, Christine, I don't remember, met with Senator Hoylman regarding the heliport. Um, Alan, were you on the call? I don't remember. Um, Borough President has a work, a task force about trying to, to ban helicopters flying over the island of Manhattan. Um, and that would include the river, um, the, eastern half of the Hudson River, because there are a number of helicopter flights since there have been moved from New York. There are now tourist flights taking off in New Jersey and buzzing the Manhattan skyline, basically. As part of that um, helicopter task force, I pushed for the closing of the 30th Street heliport, um, because, it, you know, it, it, we don't need it in the middle of our park. Um, as we have historically heard, it's either been the state or the city saying we need a heliport on the west side without any real explanation as to why. Brad was at one of those meetings and expressed an interest in hearing our point of view because I made clear to him that we would need to amend the Hudson River Park Act to prohibit the heliport instead of just moving them offshore, which is the current and has been the current proposal for the last eight years. So we had a meeting with Brad and Brad was very interested in pushing this. Um, and that was what that meeting is. And there's some steps going forward um, as to how, whether or not we can actually engage the state in closing off the 30th Street heliport. Now, this is also going to get impacted while we, since everything is connected to everything else by what happens with Gateway. Now that Gateway is going to move forward, it is going to impact the heliport. And there has been talk about relocating the heliport for Gateway. And it would be my fervent desire that if the heliport is closed for Gateway that it never comes back. Um, but that was one meeting we had. The, you know, on, on the more mundane, and I'm not trying to belittle this in any way, but the Clinton Health Kitchen Land Use Committee um, met with HPD and DOB to resolve an illegal demo and creation of affordable housing at 317 319 West 34th Street. That's it for the small meetings for the month. 
I will now turn this over to our district manager. And Jesse, when you get to the planning fellows, Maria has an idea. Uh, Lowell, also the Chelsea NYCHA RFP went out. Okay, thank you. Jesse, where's yours? Yep, I'm here. Sorry, sorry. Give me one second. Um, oh, God. It's going to be here. Um, thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, so your, the full board agenda and the committee schedules are in your Dropbox. Please take a look at them. So there's, I think, we, I think we're all on the same page, but please let me know if we're not. Um, uh, all seems to think we're not, so. Yeah, well, there's two things I wanted to highlight for the committee schedule. Um, we can go back to the full board, um, but I wanted to get to this first, is that so for land use, I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page. So uh, zoning for accessibility, uh, is coming to Clinton's Hell Kitchen land use. Um, uh, this is the uh, last of the last half of the 60 day review. Um, DCP has confirmed their attendance. They did let me know that they are particularly stretched thin and they are not able to come to two different land use committee meetings on this and probably for other some of the other applications. Uh, and that also that this Monday, the hotel special permit uh, the new hotel special permit um, application um, has, it will be uh, certified. And so that clock will start as well. So I just wanted us to quickly have maybe, a, and unfortunately JD is not here. So maybe we'll have to have this in another time. Um, but I was hoping to have a conversation about planning on who, who handles what. Um, I spoke to him about that, Jesse. Okay. Me. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, He's fine with the hotels going to uh, Chelsea land use because it's it builds upon all the stuff we've done already about the special permit on the hotels. And Paul and Betty, I, I will attend if you need assistance on that at all. Um, and then the um, zoning for accessibility going to, to Clinton land use, he's, he's fine with that too because we have the most subway stations involved in that. <clears throat> and then it's got to go to, 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 to Clue to, to weigh in too, Paul and, and Betty. Yeah, that's what, we're, that's what I was going to suggest that on the um, transit um, ZTA, um, that that come, uh, go to H, 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 go to HK, and then we have a discussion point at CLU like we had done with other ZTAs in the right. past. Right. Um, that's and, fine. And, I, and then, I so Joe, you're saying that CLU takes the hotel special permits? Yes, because uh, Clinton Health Kitchen land use has the slaughterhouse the same night. We have, we'll have Slaughterhouse and the Zoning for Accessibility. Those are two big items. That's going to be like, you know, packing your sandwiches for that night. It would be a, that would be a BLP meeting night then. Yeah. No, wait till <laughs> midnight. No way. We don't do that. We, no other committee does that. No, no, no. Nothing past nine. Um, yeah, I think that then that's, Betty, as far, as far as I'm concerned, we can take hotel special permits and one. If, if we're going to be nothing past nine, we've got to stop with comments because it's 846. Okay. Um, and, then, and then, Jesse, the one other thing I want to add on to our um, our committee agenda is the LPC review. Yes. Have a have a presentation from LPC. Yeah, we can we can I I will make that request for for May for sure. Yeah, just before we put the agenda out to public. That's all. No, of course, of course. Thank you. Um, and just so for clarity's sake, in terms of the full board agenda, I just just so sort of making sure are we. This the 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 first item you guys voted on, that's coming. We're listing that under exec. Then, since we voted on it out of exec, we're comfortable yes. with that as a joint letter. It's got to be all the committee signing on it, onto it, though, right? Right. It's a uh, joint it's a guideline. It's a joint land use letter by two by both land use committees, but it's coming out of exec. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's fine. You can come out of exec okay. as long as everybody is comfortable with that. Okay. So moving on, um, uh, yeah, so uh, planning fellows, I just wanted to remind everybody that the, uh, s s the Fund for the City of New York does their planning fellow program every year. It was doing it at this year. The deadline is May 28th. Um, we have historically always have had a, a minimum of uh, one to two, uh, sometimes even three planning fellows. Um, the, we, you know, we have, put together projects for them. Um, uh, it does take supervision. I'm just reminding everybody because you know we haven't had them for a little bit. Um, uh, Betty has done a lot of work with them in the past. Um, 
Uh, we've had one for housing actually in a few years uh, uh, when Barbara Davis was co-chair. Um, so, but they they can be used in multiple different ways. Um, they, it is an educational experience for them. So they are producing a, a presentation at the end of it. They present back to uh, to the committee uh, after being, you know, routine supervision by a committee, uh, chair, usually a co-chair of a committee, um, and then they are bringing that that whole project back to their to the class for a grade. Um, so I, I just want to remind people of it. So uh, you know, I sent it around to the land use chairs, and I think I sent it around to transportation planning as well. Um, and I know there was an idea of maybe doing having. Um, that came up after INCLU as maybe uh, having one look at the kind of um, the the other the other examples of this the conversion idea of the hotels and the office space uh, being done around the world or in the other, in around the country and seeing what worked and what didn't work and why and sort of doing a study on that that was just a suggestion I know um, but I I just wanted to flag it for everybody because we do need to produce if we want them we need to submit projects and people need to be their supervisors. So Jesse, you mentioned it could be one, two or three. Is there a limit as to how many? Because from uh, land use, we could see two possibilities. One is on the um, sort of national international study of conversion of distressed properties. Um, but the other one is the expansion of uh, historic districts uh, for Chelsea be the expansion of West Chelsea and for Hell's Kitchen, we might want to look into better resources for Patty's Market and the Special Clinton District. So we might want a fellow for historic issues. I, I can't guarantee you, I can't guarantee you, you know, I think we've historically had a really good relation. We produce really good projects. <laughs> we, we really do uh, historically have asked these, these planners to really produce some great work. Um, I, I, and I'm gonna say the, the, one of the ones I remember the most and is the one that was recently out of Clinton Hell's Kitchen, which, which was the residential trash project there. So um, yeah, I can't guarantee you what we'll, if we'll get two or three, but if, you know, um, you know, but uh, it really matters how, how much we're willing to handle um, and how what their what their applicants are, you know, we'll say, uh, what their applicants are like. So um, I think if there's, I think we should prioritize in the sense that if we're submitting a bunch, I think we want to be clear to them that, you know, we think, you know, it's very to identify the students in their capacity. <laughs> So have to be yeah, I mean, it. these are international students too. So, you know, you're going to have a, a large uh, spectrum there. Uh, Jesse, I think if uh, uh, JD is not here, but obviously the trash uh, project was supposed to get a, a, a phase two where the guidelines for the building would be written and proposed just like, you know, uh, and so that would be really one good project is to finish that project because we we never finalize the guidelines that we would like the zoning to pass for the garbage. And I think that's a piece which is missing and we should have our internal gu uh, guidelines as well. I'm, I mean, I'm again, I'm, if the committee is, uh, wants to submit that and write like that up, I can certainly send that around, you know, the original okay. proposal and then the, the end result of that, the product there and the people want to put together. It doesn't require much. I mean, Betty has done this many times. It's, you know, you know, a page, a page and a half, you know, of, and I can send, I think I sent around some examples to everybody of previous application and a project proposal. So it doesn't take much. I can certainly put that in there for sure. Okay. I Again, I will just say you, we don't always can't, you know, these are planning fellows. So they're, they're, you know, they're not writing zoning, you know, they're not zoning, and, you know, experts per se, you know, they're, they're learning as well. So I, I just, I just want to make sure we're not expecting, you know, too much of them. So, excuse me. So uh, Jesse, are you saying that each committee can submit a proposal for a, fe for a fellows project? Uh, I mean, I've, they're 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 planning their 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 field of expertise and their their field of study is planning and city urban planning and zoning and that so it has to sort of fall into you want to fall it in, into that area I, I it doesn't exclude any committee from applying I'm not I, I'm not the arbitrary I think that you'd be up to you guys I, I you know historically it's been a land use land use or you know somewhat a how human services 
discussion, but it can be transportation. If, if there's a, if there's a, a maybe a school issue or a, a study of something about arts and culture or something that you would like to, I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm okay. not the, not didn't didn't uh, didn't Maria want to say something about didn't you Maria didn't you I was want patiently to... I was patiently waiting my turn, <laughs> um, but I think Christine and Bert already spoke. I mean Alan, um, I was just going to say that um, after my meeting with Fordham, uh, I realized that maybe it would be a wonderful idea to have a social work intern be part of the community board. I don't know if to support Triple H S or to or Jesse to support you and your staff. But um, thinking about myself as a social work student, I was more interested in macro practice uh, and community organizing. And this would be a great opportunity for a student like I was interested in those things. Maria, and I am I, a field instructor. Maria, I just, I just want to clarify something. Are you saying Jesse and the staff need a social worker on staff because the job is too hard? <laughs> <laughs> because we're all crazies. <laughs> right, but, but Maria, yes. remember, to do that, you have to have credentials. And if you, that, that would be directly responsible. If you have the ability to do that. I am a field instructor, I do. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But it means that you have to be supervising all the time. Yeah, I know. So, are, interns are work. Yeah, I know. I just had an intern who finished, uh, right. you know, recently. And I did allow her to come with me to just some community board meetings, which she found super fascinating. So it's just an idea, you know, um, uh, I, we'll, we'll have an ongoing discussion about it, I'm sure. But. My suggestion with that is this, because I've done it before, I, I am SIFI certified and I've supervised before, it was something like this, you know, we're not set up, that's not normally what we do and we're particularly not set up for it, like I don't have a space. <laughs> um, um, I'm trying very hard not to pay attention to Dale's cat right now. Um, uh, uh, I know, and, I can't uh, help it. Yeah, and, uh, but I do think if there's a project that could use, you know, uh, a community organizing, someone in community organizing or something along those lines, um, and they're interested, again, I think that's great. I think it should be, it really is gonna have to be project-based. I, I don't wanna give anybody the impression that our office is going to be a place where they're going to be able to pick up experience in like client one-on-one -on -one client work, or mm -hmm. even, you know, even community organizing when we don't have a, a set project kind of, you know, figured out. That's my only concern with that, but I'm completely fine. You with don't it. have an unpacked office. Well, right. Yeah. I don't have an, like, there's so like, things, there's like there's specific things, but like, you know, I don't want them just sitting there, you know, seven, yeah. days, seven days, I mean, at seven days, seven hours a day and like looking for something to do, you know. So it would be about eight hours or 10 hours a week, something hours. like that. Just, it could be I'm virtual. Like, I, think um, we, I think it's a great idea. I'm a huge fan of social workers. I just want to make sure we give them that there's a there's yes. meat on the bone rather than yeah. us like looking. I've been, I was a, my, one of my internships was at a, as an elected official's office. And I was, you know, it was sometimes, you know, long stretches where there was not necessarily work for me to do <laughs> so i'm hearing i'll, I'll think about i'll think about it somewhere. and a field a field social worker with the responsibility um needed to oversee this position offer herself in some manner or another from a social work perspective i think that that's pretty remarkable so maybe there needs to be a a conversation separate or if there, if there more, more thought needs to go behind the idea yeah. but i mean this is pretty um remarkable that there's something being offered like this. Um, and I think we should just consider it a little bit more. Yeah, definitely. I'll, I'll, I'll do some more thinking also about how someone could be useful really, and also gain experience. But I, mean, I have, really do believe that it would be a wonderful experience for a social work student. We have plenty of, pro I mean, you know, I think we should look back at the study that um, we did for this, uh, uh, the, the district needs analysis that has a lot of recommendations and suggestions and we could pull a project from that you know yeah, that's a as, good idea. Next, next step sort of like what christine was saying we had the we have the initial data now we can say what do we want to do with it right yeah i'll do some um, more things. so you know and you we know, that, you know how we had that study it. on the needs of the elderly i'm sorry didn't we have a study on the needs of the elderly 
to the district. We had that too. I mean, years prior to that, we've had that too. We can definitely yeah. take a look at those recommendations. That was that would be something That's perfect. I, I just right. want to throw a pail of cold water, everybody, please. It's got to be something that is practical and actually yeah. makes a difference. And you don't want a student set up with high expectations. Right. And then it just doesn't get to be something that works given our structure. So Maria, yeah. and, you, and you're kind of committed, I just want to note. <laughs> and speaking of someone who's very committed and overcommitted, just putting that out there for you to hear, okay? Why are you telling the whole world in a public meeting about me? <laughs> <laughs> so, the truth. I'm um, more from one committed president. person to another. Just, exactly, <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. Exactly. <laughs> Perfect, Christy. Yes, Joe. I yeah, hear you. I was going to say, Joe you know, just admitted he's overcommitted. You know. Yeah. I, I, I never yeah, well, did that before. This I'll is just a wrap up. Now. I'll wrap up real quick. Oh, wait a minute before you wrap up, Jesse. Betty has her hand up. Okay. Um. Yeah. Have, having done this a number of times, I just wanted to identify that these these students are usually planning students. They're from Columbia or NYU. And I think that we have to think of sort of planning uh, right. topics or projects. But uh, for a couple of years, we had uh, fellows for developing the Hell's Kitchen South neighborhood plan to deal with the Port Authority's issues. and. We had fantastic, some fantastic interns, some of which ended up being employed by Clinton Housing and uh, went on to bigger and better things. We, the last two were working on uh, open space issues and what kind of open space people wanted. And they did a survey and maps and what have you. Then the pandemic hit and that was it. They were, <laughs> they were out of there, uh, but they, it is kind of labor intensive. And so one has to really think of what's practical and, and it's time, it's got a time window of time when these students start and when they end and they have vacations that they're not working on the project. So after, anyway, I, I'm not um, volunteering this year to supervise anyone, but I will be available to read proposals and give advice. <laughs> Always good. <laughs> okay, Jesse, back to you. Yeah, I was just gonna say, Paul, so yeah. I'll, Paul said we had to be done by nine, so we're at our limit here. Okay, so uh, yeah, so I mean, I'll please contact me if you want to, uh, you know, apply and, and, uh, and uh, for a project and, uh, and we can figure it out, so. That's all I've got to say. Um, and so technically, uh, one last thing is uh, per the city's directive, we are beginning our, our moving back, staff moving back into the office. Um, that's going to be next week. Um, so uh, Nellie and Janine will be doing uh, two, two days a week off, not at the same time. So we're coverage, have coverage for most of the week. I'll be doing um, you know, somewhere between two and three days a week as well. We will not be taking walk-ins at this point. We can, we're going to slowly, you know, figure that out. We have to, as Joe said, we literally have to unpack our boxes first. <laughs> um, uh, and so, but we will be doing that. So we'll, we'll, uh, um, we'll be in the office and that will slowly get more ramped up and ramped up. Um, and that's it. All right. Does anyone have any questions about anything from the district manager's report? Christine. I have an item of new business, if you don't mind. Well, let me finish with the, okay. with Jesse's. Any questions on the district manager's report? Marty. I just, you just raised a red flag for me. The, 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 the virus isn't over yet. I'm sure you're aware of that. And I, I want you to be really cautious about opening that office. I, Marty, I truly appreciate it. And uh, I am putting together our reopening plan currently. I will say our building does a very good job. Uh, uh, it, has a, it has a temperature check and then it also has a whole guest check-in. Um, and uh, me and the staff are talking about it a lot. And so I appreciate it, Marty. And we are, no, no, none of us want to put anybody at, at, uh, at risk. Um, fortunately, I will say the majority of our office is vaccinated, which is a good thing. Um, 
uh, and uh, hope to have it all, we all vaccinated very shortly. Thank you. Okay, anything else at the office or otherwise? All right, new business, Christine. Uh, Dale, you want to take that? Yes, thanks, Christine. It was about the, did you see the back and forth, Lowell, about the letter to um, related about their garage op entrance? Mm -hmm. So there let's, is let's do a background, maybe. I'm sorry, I'm, sure. going, to, I'm going to do the Joe's, uh, the Joe's function. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is a it, there is a matter of some urgency because unfortunately a pedestrian was killed while she was on the sidewalk in front of the Time Warner garage, and um, we we had a meeting. We met with the people from Related, representatives of Related, and they expressed interest in you know there is an investigation underway, but they also expressed interest in remediating the conditions that led to this fatality. Among which it seems to be the fact that there is a sidewalk shed that is obstructing pedestrian sight lines as you approach the garage. Mm. So one of the things we did, and, this, and the work is done, uh, related is gonna apply to have the, site, the shed removed. We're gonna send a letter to DOB asking them to please expedite that process to the degree possible in the interest of public safety. But we would like to maybe rush the letter to related that says, that gives our recommendations, which some are which are short term and some of which are longer term, but among the short term ones, it is to actually keep that garage door entrance closed until the shed is removed. They do have an entrance on 60th street, which is not obstructed by a shed. Who, whose shed is it, Dale? Is it their own shed or someone it's, else's shed? It's related. It's related to their own shed, okay. They were doing work on the facade. We were told a couple of, like last week that the work is completed and they're in the process of getting approval to remove it from the DOB. Um, so it's a matter of weeks, but in the meantime, they could also just stop using that entrance. It's pretty crazy. I mean, you know, the legs of the shed are blocking the exit. As a result, the people who are exiting the, the, the garage are coming contraway into the entrance side. So if you are a pedestrian, you would be approaching the entrance, but in fact, the car is coming from the exit. And uh, that's one of the many problems on this entrance. All right, what are the other recommendations that you would put in this proposed letter? Well, the other recommendations are that the entrance is not compliant with some um, zoning text that was adopted in 2013, they're not. They're not legally bound to comply with these recommendations, but it would be quite easy for them to comply with these recommendations voluntarily, which is basically like a sign and uh, you know, uh, certain, certain restrictions on the width of the entrance and clearances and also full ADA compliance. So we're, so we're requesting that they close the entrance until the shed is down. We're offering to uh, ask the DOB to expedite the approval of the removal of the shed. And we're asking them to comply with the zoning text that was adopted in 2013, which did not retroactively apply to garage entrances, but we're asking them to meet the new standards anyway, as a matter of good faith and in the public interest of public safety. Okay, Paul. Um, just out of curiosity, the, the parking garage on my block, when a car exits the garage, um, it triggers an alarm that sounds. So when I'm walking on the sidewalk, I hear an alert. Is there such a system at that garage that no. there's an alert? So can we maybe add uh, some sort of metal detector to sound an alert or a flashing light or something? Well, the other thing, the other thing which is in the zoning uh, achieved the same thing. I yeah. mean, you know, there is a speed bump and a stop sign. So essentially the speed bump, the people slow down completely. Yeah, but I mean, I heard that the, the car was only going about 10 miles an hour and knocked the person down. And that's, and so an alert, so the person picks their face up from their phone and looks at the car coming at them. You guys have an objection? I mean, to I mean, we can, no, that's fine. We, we can, can put expand, it in. We can expand the language where it says, we want you to comply with the two thir 2013 regs and also apply any other measures that are standard, such as uh, uh, auditory right. alerts for moving vehicles. So we can do that. It, Paul, if you have a brief description of what of your of the system that's in place, just email it to me so I can include it. 
I'll, I'll, I'll make something up and send it to you. Ah, fabricated. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Also, Typically Related doesn't actually have the, um, the license on the garage. And I just wanted to know, are you sure that they operate the garage or is it a third they, party? You're absolutely right. They do not operate the garage. However, um, it's, a, it's a third party. However, they are the building owner and they came to the meeting and we, we do not have any contact with the garage operator as of yet. So if we, have, okay. if we I, I work with a bunch of garage openers, uh, garage uh, operators. So if, uh, if I can be helpful, let me know. Like if you know the company name, but also um, just they may be the ones not encouraging the closing of the 59th Street exit just practically speaking, yeah, if they are like worried about managing flow. Right. Um, Christine, you had the name of the operator, right? Yeah, it's, I think it's MTN or something like that. It's one of the large ones, but not one of the better ones. I, you know, we know related, we have a lot of connection with them and they are big guys and they can probably uh, get the operator to do the right thing because everybody insurance, everybody's going to get sued. So I think that's, uh, that has been- You would just think, that seems so right. You would just think that they've already, they would have already like closing an entrance when you have another serviceable entrance seems, seems yeah. totally reasonable. There must I, be I something wonder, that's keeping them. I, I just wonder, so that's why, you see, Christine, I just wonder if you should CC the operator. Yes, yeah. yes, the operator would be CC. And okay. uh, also we, um, we did, raised the suggestion of closing the um, the entrance until the shed came, went down. And right. they, I mean, they were not like, oh no, that's impossible. They, they were open to the concept. Okay, any other questions on this proposed letter? I'll entertain a motion then. Well, we should send out this one and the DOB one, right? Because the, the DOB, DOB one is simply a letter we ha I think we need to get like the permit number from them, but it's simply a letter saying, please DOB, do whatever you can to expedite this process so they can get that shut off. All right, so it's two letters, it's two actually two letters. Yes. And I'll still entertain a motion. So moved. moved. All right, I heard two voices, so I'll take one as a second. All those in favor of sending this as soon as possible. Thank and you. Aye. Thanks everyone, I appreciate it. And Martin Treat will appreciate it greatly. He's been All very right. exercised about this. Any other new business, old business matters that we need to address as an executive committee? Hearing none, I will Move adjourn. To adjourn. Thank you all for coming. That Thanks, night. guys. Night. 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 Hello? Are, are oh, we doing we... a oh, we're... board authority meeting? Yes, we're here. <laughs> We were until everybody just jumped off, but JD wasn't going to be able to JD, be. JD, and where's Joe? Joe, no. Joe, Joe. Joe jumped off. Can you get him back? I don't think so. It's because <laughs> I can try. He, but... Jesse didn't push him off. Joe jumped off. He forgot. Joe took the. Joe he took might the have forgotten. Off. I think he forgot. Okay. We are who we are. I'm um, calling him now. Okay, thanks, Jesse. I don't think we have to go very long. Well, I don't want to go very long. No, we don't want to go very long. So, so talk quickly. Well, I saw my email. I think what we need to do is just be clear. Wait, do we have a new, a new meeting time, Jesse? No, hold on one second. Let me just get rid of some folks here. <laughs> they, they haven't left yet? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> We're still live. Uh, I mean, you've got to turn me. Meetings canceled.